the um, planning commission hearing of uh, December 17, 2020. So we are via teleconference only. Um, you can watch us. All town of Fairfax public meetings will be conducted using teleconferencing or other electronic means consistent with the state of California executive order numbers N25-20 and N29-20 to protect public health while still maintaining- And really try to protect our healthcare system so that all of us can get the care we need and- Excuse me? Uh, Jim, Jill Templeton is unmuted and speaking. Okay, all right. You fixed that. Um, I'm going to apologize. So cable channels 27 and 99, by the way. Uh, the town will not offer an in-person physical meeting location for the public. The public will be able to view the meeting on television and online as usual and participate in the meeting by teleconference and email. Members of the public may join or watch the meeting live using any of the following options. I'll just start with W's, you know, 3W dot town of one word, town of Fairfax dot org slash watch dash live slash um, HTTPS W is town of Fairfax dot org slash watch dash live dash two slash HTTPS CM uh, colon slash slash CM CM dot TV uh, or t colon dot uh, uh, TV uh, slash 27. On Zoom, you can click on the link that you received um, or HTTPS slash slash US O2 web dot Zoom dot US slash J, if you get this, let me know, 842-7052-1962. It's all in the online agenda, folks. You can click on those. Um, the Zoom telephone call-in is 1669-900-6833 or 1346-248-7799. I'll repeat that, 1346-248-7799. The webinar ID is 842-7052-1962. Again, if you have the online agenda, which you can get right now if you want it, you can click on these. Members of the public may provide uh, pr public comment during the meeting using one of the following options. Using the public comment form directly below the live stream meeting on the town website or on Zoom, select the raise hand function during the public comment time and you'll be unmuted when it is your turn. Or three, if you're calling in, Press star nine during the public comment time to raise your hand and star six to be unmuted to speak. Prior to the meeting, as always, members of the public may submit written comments to the Planning Commission. If comments are received after the circulation of the Commission meeting packet, but prior to the start of the meeting, they will be sent to the Planning Commission and will be part of the meeting record. If comments are received after the start of the meeting, they will be part of the meeting record. Public comments will not be read aloud by staff at the meeting, although I understand that some emails that are received will be read by some members of staff up to three minutes long. Um, so let's have our call to order, please, which we are doing, and the roll call. Okay, Clark? I am here, thanks. Okay, Fragoso? Or did we lose her? I was muted. I'm here. Okay. Gonzalez Parber? Here. Newton? Here. Swift? Here. Rodriguez? Present. Chair Green? Here. Wonderful. Okay. So um, we have a next item is the approval of the agenda. But I want to, I want to, so we have 11 attendees. What I'm trying to figure out is, um, just to let you know, is number two, which is amendments to town code, isn't a project. And I was considering, just putting it out, is moving that to the dis just before the discussion so that we can get through the 169 Ridgeway, 553 Taylor and 18 Napa, um, depending on you know, whether people here on the panel think that we're going to have a long discussion on item two, and also depending on whether members of the attendees, um, you know, why should they wait till we have a long discussion on ordinance items? So um, that's the question. Um, anybody want to discuss that or? And I think also we got something from staff mentioning they wanted to add an item. 
So we should talk about that change too. Okay, I think that item is um, the six, the new six item election of chair and vice chair for 2021. Correct. Yes, and we were able to add that to the agenda. Um, right. 72 so hours. That'll still be there. I just, I just wondering, so does, let me just ask this. So amendments to town code item two is, is there, do you feel members of the panel of the planning commission that there will be a long discussion on that item well i think the other part of that is that we may have members of the public for that as well we may have that would be good to know so i don't know if can tamala find out can, is there any way to find out what members of the public can they raise their hands if they're here for that item right. number two that's what I would recommend is to ask any members of the public who uh, wish to speak on the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor uh, item to raise their, to use the hand raise function. Well, if people aren't aware of that, it's at the bottom of your screen, you click on the more. No, where is it, uh, Tam Tamala? Yes, for our participants, it should be on the bottom of their screen. They have a different screen than us. Okay. And I do see one participant's raised his hand. There's 12. Okay, so John apparently is here for that item. Uh, so every so can we assume everybody else is here for one of the um, project items? Can we can we have a raise of hands on on that possibly? And so, now we do see more more hands in the audience. It's a great exercise to see who knows how to raise their hand too. Okay. Um, could we verify John's last name and make sure he isn't John Wilson that's here for 169 Ridgeway and is getting confused? Sure, we could ask him. He has been given permission to talk. Hi, <clears throat> my name's John. Um, I'm with TWM Architects and I'm here in regards to 53 Taylor Drive. Okay. Okay, great. Right. So, Thank you. So it, it, I guess, what do you think, panel? Should we just leave things the way they are then or? You want to move this off to I'll go ahead and move that we modify the agenda to move item number two, the amendments to the town code title 17 under um, now replacing item four um, before the discussion item on the housing element. Okay, that sounds good. Is there a second? Thank you. Second. Is there? I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Mamie. And so Let's have a vote on that movement. Clark? Yes. Fergoso? Okay. Gonzalez Parber? Yes. Newton? Yes. Swift? Guy. Rodriguez? Yes. Chair Green? Yes. Okay, perfect. So that means that the um, Items one, item one, 169 remains one. Item two goes to after 18 Napa Avenue. So the next, um, very good, okay. Chair Green, this is Tamala. If I may just mention as an order of business to our attendees that I did just lower all of their hands, but I do invite them to raise their hands again during those times in the meeting. Okay, perfect. I see that, okay, great. So, then we need a motion, I guess, to approve the new agenda, or is that a motion you think is, is good enough to move that agenda item, maybe? We move the agenda item. We haven't, you know, actually approved the agenda yet. So do, you, so we hear, do we have a motion to approve the new I agenda? I move that we approve the agenda item as amended. Thank you. Second? I'll modify that to add or I guess we don't need to anymore because we have the 72 hour notice. So I'll second that motion. Okay, Clark. Aye, yes. Fragoso? Yes. Gonzalez Parber? Aye. Newton? Aye. Swift? Aye. Rodriguez? Aye. Chair Green? Aye. Okay, thank you. All right, so we've done approval of the agenda. The next um, item on the agenda is the meeting protocol, which I need to remind everybody that I will maintain order at the meetings in accordance with Robert's rules of order. 
and the commission has the responsibility to be a model of respectful in of respectful uh, behavior in order to encourage community participation and citizen input at commission meetings. The commission and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motive of commission members, staff, or members of the public, and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. Um, so regarding public comments on non-agenda items, which is, which is coming up, uh, anyone wishing to address the commission on matters not on the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the commission must do so by email or in person via Zoom in the manner described above when I was reading all that, that you can click on, as I mentioned, from, by downloading the agenda. Um, please state the matter on which you wish to speak. Matters not appearing on the commission's agenda will not receive action at this meeting, but may be referred to staff for a future meeting. So, you know, if you have, don't be afraid to speak up. Pre and presentations will be limited to three minutes or as otherwise established by me, but it will be, make it three minutes. Persons are not required to give their name or address, but it's helpful for speakers to state their name for the record and whether or not they are Fairfax residents in order to, uh, in order for the secretary to identify them. Regarding conduct, all interested persons are invited to participate in these public hearings. In order to give all interested persons an opportunity to be heard and to ensure the presentation of all points of view, members of the audience should, one, limit presentations to three minutes. Two, provide your comments by email as described above, you know, preferably a week or so before the hearing time so that staff doesn't have to go crazy trying to, you know, uh, relate them. Uh, three, state views and concerns succinctly. Four, submit any new documents to the planning staff first via email to be entered into the record. So there are no items on the consent calendar uh, at this time. Um, are there any public comments on non-agenda items? I do see one hand raised, Chair Green. Okay, Jessica Green. Jessica? You can Hello. Hi. Um, yes, I'm a Fairfax uh, resident. I'm not sure whether this is a topic that has to do with the planning department, but I'm a little concerned. I know there's a uh, fire danger with trees and that people are take, trying to clear space around their houses with trees and stuff like that. And I hear the chainsaws going, but what concerns me is that a lot of these trees, first of all, they hold the hills together because most people, a lot of people don't have any retaining walls. And the other thing is they soak up a lot of water that otherwise will go down to the flatlands and cause flooding. And I think, you know, I think just that we need to be aware of that aspect of, of the tree cutting thing, uh, because they're, they're so important to our ecology here. And that, that's all I want to say. I don't know how the planning commission deals with those things, but I just think it's an important point that's been concerning me. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I have one comment to that. I agree with you completely. I hear a lot of saws around town, and I don't know if this could be possible, but maybe the tree committee or the building inspector could go around just a little bit and listen for that and see if maybe we're overdoing it. Um, so there, you know, I don't know, just a recommendation. Okay. So are there any more uh, public comments on non-agenda items? I do not see any additional hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Then we will move on to, like I said, there are no items on the consent calendar, so there's no nothing there. And we have the first public hearing item, which is 169 Ridgeway Avenue application number 20-13. And this is continued from November 19th. Staff, thank you. Yes, yeah, so this item was continued at the request of the neighbor to the north of the project site. The applicants, in, at the, the applicants indicated their willingness to shift the proposed house five feet to the south to the center of the property so that the visual impacts 
um, would be shared equally by each of the neighboring properties, but um, the offer came uh, right before the meeting. And so the neighbor really didn't have enough time to um, digest, review the plans and digest the proposed change. So in re-reviewing the project, we determined that this site is in the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor as currently mapped. And therefore we re-noticed the project for tonight's meeting to include a Ridgeline development permit. Uh, the discussion about the other discretionary permits can be found in the November uh, packet. So the purpose of the Ridgeline permit, the Ridgeline corridor permit process is to conserve the general public welfare by conserving the existing scenic resources and the sense of community and or neighborhood identity now afforded by the presence of unurbanized open space on the ridge tops above the town by preserving them in an open and scenically attractive state. The town code prohibits construction within the ridgeline corridors unless the planning commission approves a ridgeline permit. The, or, the ridgeline ordinance describes the criteria the planning commission shall use for reviewing a ridgeline scenic corridor permit and the criteria include but are not limited to the following. Cuts and fills and retaining walls shall be minimized. If, if exterior lighting is to be installed, it shall be of low level intensity and low profile. Utilities and cables shall be placed underground. All structures shall be located so that the roof does not extend above the ridge line or where a ridge lot is too flat to allow placement of a roof or building or structure down from the ridge line. No part of the roof may extend more than 15 feet above the lowest elevation of the adjacent ridge line. The 169 Ridgeway site is set 40 feet in elevation below the uppermost portion of the ridge line that is visible from downtown Fairfax along Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. The site is visible from Chester Avenue and from the upper portions of the properties on the east side of Willow Avenue. And of course, it's visible as you travel along Ridgeway Avenue, which is parts of it are actually on the top of the ridge line. And this site is set a little bit off the ridge line with the road on the ridge line. Okay, here. The site is relatively small and they're proposing a relatively small house in an almost built out neighborhood hillside area. There are other two story structures on Ridgeway above and below the project site that extend more than 15 feet above the roadway, which runs along the ridge. The project site is located toward the bottom of a saddle on the ridge at an elevation of 266 feet with Ridgeway continuing uphill to 310 feet in elevation, in elevation. The house has been designed so that it is one story at the street where the required parking has been provided. The stairwell for the proposed house extends above the one story garage to an elevation that is roughly 14 feet above the Ridgeway Avenue roadbed. There are two stories two-story houses across the street from the project site and on the same side of the street further north on Ridgeway Avenue that present two-story facades to the street. Moving the house down the hillside with the parking provided on Chester will result in large amounts of excavation and retaining walls staff estimates will have to reach approximately 15 to 17 feet in height to provide the required parking. Designing a house on a hillside with the parking on the upper street and the house moved down the hillside and accessed by stairs is not desirable because fire code regulations now require that a hydrant be no more than 150 feet from all exterior walls of the building. We believe that accessing it from Ridgeway is the most sensible location to build on this Ridgeline site. At the last meeting, the, uh, the applicant presented a revised site plan with the house shifted to the south so that the structure and deck would maintain equal setbacks from both the neighboring house to the north at 167 Ridgeway and to the south at 21 Chester. We believe the findings can be made for all the discretionary permits being requested for this development and therefore we're recommending that you approve application 20-13 by adopting Resolution 2020-11, which sets forth the findings and the conditions for project approval and approval of the Hill Area Residential Development, Design Review, Excavation, Tree Removal, and Ridgeline Development Permits. And that would conclude our report. Okay, thank you, Linda Neal. That's a fantastic report. It's, the project seems to have gotten a little more complex than it was last month, but um, mm -hmm. are there any questions 
of the uh, to for the staff. Uh, Norma, I think your hand was up first. Yes, thank you. Uh, and it is an excellent uh, staff report, Linda, particularly with the new Ridgeline information. Uh, that was extremely helpful. Could you just clarify for me that staff's recommendation is that the house not be moved down toward Chester because of the additional field excavation that would be required and the fire uh, requirements, but also uh, does it require that the house be more centered, more equidistant from all properties? I was not clear if that was required. Yes. Okay, staff is staff is supporting the relocation to the center of the site. That will not require the new excavation. No. Okay. It's still, it's still taking access from from Ridgeline Ridgeway Avenue, which runs along the top of the site. Right. So it's not, there's minimal excavation. Which is the perfect way to do it. And then my final clarification is that even though there was some discussion about perhaps some willingness to lower the roof at that uppermost portion, that is not being recommended. We are leaving it as that's, yeah, it that's, was. That's staff's recommendation, but the owner has provided you with a elevation with, red, with a red dotted line to show you what it would look like if they did remove that. They would prefer not to, but they did prepare that um, attachment for you. Okay, thank you. That clarifies the attachment for me. And uh, I am not in favor of forcing them to make that design change, given the limited impact. Uh, but I will let it go at that. Thank you for your clarifications. Okay, any other thing? Uh, Michelle? Yes, I do. I have a question. Um, so the infield wood, the stand things out in the field, those are representing the November uh, 19th packet, right? Not the new red line drawings dated 12-9. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other, any other questions for staff at the moment on this project? I have one in the in the staff report, page six. There's a condition offered um, could be added requiring installation of a 24 inch box size uh, oak, but that condition isn't spelled out with 24 inch in the rezo. And I was just wondering if anything has changed since the report to the rezo or anything. Uh, so we brought it to your attention. Um, the staff person that prepared this staff report um, doesn't necessarily feel that the site needs any more trees, but if the planning commission feels that that would, you know, add visual buffers for neighbors or, you know, soften the facade of that house that I added it in there so that you would have, have the wording if you wanted to put it in as a condition. Right, but is, is any, I understand that, thanks. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, but I, what I'm asking is about the 24 inch box size isn't specified in the condition in the rezo, even though it's mentioned as a potential one, not that we're going for it. I just was trying to clarify the point. Oh, um, so it's mentioned I, in page six in the second paragraph as a condition could be added requiring installation of a 24 inch box, but in the condition, uh, well, it wasn't my intention to add it into the resolution. That was that I was intending to leave it up to the commission whether they wanted to add it into the resolution. Okay. So, so that clarifies. That somehow me. got in there. I'm, I apologize. No, it's fine. Okay. okay, that's fine. Thank you. Any more any more questions for staff on this project before we hear from the owner? Yes, I have one. Yes. Go for it. Yeah. Linda, that is just yeah. adorable. Um, <clears throat> it's our rodent control officer. 
<laughs> hey, Linda, can you give me a brief explanation of how we missed the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor issue the first time around? So I can make sure I understand so this we don't miss it in the future. Yes, I can. So the top of the ridge line is up where um, where the dirt road starts, like the, the knob of the ridge line. And I just was thinking that's the top of the ridge line. And I didn't go back and I didn't have time to go through my normal plan check that I do where I actually go and check the thing. So I relied on my memory and I thought it wasn't in the ridge line. So my lesson was learned. Do not rely on your memory. Fill out your checklist every single project. <laughs> yeah. I think it also serves to point out the nature of the ridge line issues are, you know, fairly, uh, there's a lot of them. Any more, any more questions for staff on this uh, project? Okay, well then we, we uh, usually go into hearing from the owner and or architect. Um, and I invite them to, uh, to have a moment now. We ask questions, et cetera. Uh, thank you, council members. Um, uh, I believe that Ms. Neal has represented our project very accurately. Um, we've tried our best to create a reasonable house within the envelope that exists on the site. It is a small site. Um, we're a family of four. Uh, we hope to finish the house before our children move out. Um, so, uh, um, and, and as mentioned previously, this is my, my father's design. Um, it's been a lifelong wish of mine to live in a house that my father designed. And it's nice to have the opportunity. Um, but like I said, I believe that Ms. Neal represented our project well. Uh, and I don't believe I have anything to add at the time at the present time. I'm sorry, sir. I believe you were muted. You're right. The technology gets away from me sometimes. Okay, Michelle, you had your hand up for questions. I thank you. I have um, a couple of questions. The first question and what I'm zeroing in on is the height of the structure from the roadway. Um, and so when I look at the staff report that was just published that has the topography, it appears as if the topographical line, well, let me just ask you, what is the elevation on the pavement at the roadway? And then uh, once you answer that question, then I want to talk to you about the plans. It is uh, 11 feet, 11 inches. No, the elevation line at the edge of the roadway appears to be, looks like 143.4, do you agree? Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that piece of paper in front of me. Um, I, my wife is grabbing it for me. I thought you meant the, the height of the garage uh, roof. Okay, well, maybe we'll just start with that thought until you get your paper in hand. So what I'm looking at is the top topography that shows the edge of the roadway at 143.4. And so then we go to the revised set of plans um, that your dad prepared showing the red lines. And so I think what I'm focusing in on is the public comments regarding the entry being too high and your dad has reflected some changes to that, including these red dash lines. And I think in particular, the two areas are the east elevation and then the, I guess the south elevation, which would be the most impacted. And so if you have a 143.4 elevation at the roadway, then the, it, it appears as if it's a two story from the road and then you had that extra line. So I guess you're only increasing the height from the road to uh, the walk up by, it appears like two feet, maybe three, three inches to the front facade of the building. Do you agree with that? I believe I do. Okay. And so what happens with the interior space when you delete that, um, when you reduce that tower structure? It's just a, um, my recollection, and I'm sorry, I have the plans, but I didn't pull them out right now. Is that, um, it's, that just is our, a, it's our entryway. Right. Um, and, um, my wife's request that we have uh, 
a somewhat formal Beijing entryway. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is uh, almost three feet higher than the garage level, not quite. Um, and uh, it is to create a little bit more of a welcoming grand space there uh, before you head down the stairs to the main level of the house. Okay, so the difference in the height by removing, by lowering that, comparing the 12, 9, 20 plan to, I guess, which is plan, and then the second plan, page four, which doesn't have the changes, but on the south elevation shows the height from the roadway at 14 feet. So that 14 feet is the revised, uh, re reduced height. Um, it looks like it's the roadway elevation. There's a red line from, I don't know where it's going to. On page four, ma'am? Mm -hmm. um, uh, page four, south elevation, red line showing what appears to be a line from the edge of roadway then to that. Yeah, st staff, uh, staff prepared that. And that oh, is, I'm sorry. It is a line showing the edge of the roadway to show the height above the top of the ridge that the, that, that uppermost point is going to show that it doesn't go more than 15 feet above the top of the ridge line. So the bottom line is then on the revised plan, how much are you lowering that tower? If, uh, if we are asked to revise the plans, we're lowering it, I believe it is uh, two feet, nine and three quarters of an inch. Two feet, nine inches lower. Then uh, might, the sorry, it might be two feet eleven and three quarters of an inch. I apologize. Two feet eleven and three quarter. Uh, that's uh, over the plans from the November nineteenth, and there would be no significant hardship on, in terms of interior space, right? Uh, it would be a disappointment, but we're willing to offer that. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, Commissioner Fergoso, then Commissioner Swift. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I have made a comment. I'll let the, com the Commissioner Swift go and you can come back around to me. Okay, go for it, Commissioner Swift. Okay, question and it relates to that same um, central staircase element. There was some correspondence between a neighbor um, that we received today, Ms. Elliott and yourself okay. concerning the height, the concern over the height of the structure. And your um, response to her was that you would be willing to lower the roof over the entry stairs to that, um, to that of the garage. And I just <laughs> wanted clarification if, if what you were talking about, the roof over the entry stairs is the same that um, part of the structure that's referred to elsewhere as the central staircase feature. We're talking that same elevated piece, is that? Yes, ma'am, I believe it is the same feature on the house that Ms. Rodriguez was just discussing. All right, I just wanted to double check that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for the uh, applicant? Well, seeing none, then we will close the applicant period. And uh, uh, if you could come back to me at this point, please, since there's yes. no other commissioner yes, questions for the applicant. Uh, Thank you. I'm still on the uh, exam. Still, still on what I will call the tower, the yes. taller portion of that building. Uh, I understand you're being asked and considering lowering that two feet. But is that section not about 32 feet from the roadway? Yes, ma'am. So 32 to almost 40 feet from the roadway, which I would, I would venture to say from 40 feet away, the two feet would be indistinguishable an indistinguishable difference that seems an arbitrary change to, uh, to this design. And um, I understand you're, you're being pressured uh, to accommodate, but uh, I find it arbitrary for such an insignificant difference. And also, 
I, I think a question perhaps for staff more than the applicant in looking at the photograph, I was very glad to see the photograph on page five of the staff report because it seems to me the house on the opposite corner of the proposed development has an even higher roof that is closer to the roadway. Is that not so, Linda? Are you, are you asking about a house that fronts on, on Ridgeway or visibility, I, or what the, I, what the site looks like from far away? I'm asking about the house on page five, opposite the one that you've circled in red, the parcel we're talking about, the house opposite to the yeah. right. Yeah, that was, that's what I was trying to point out by taking that photo is that when you look from when you look from places that the Ridgeline corridors, you know, places, public places that the site is visible from where, where the general public might view it from, it really, it, it, it nestles in amongst the other houses. The other houses look taller than this house. You, it, you're really not going to see it. The red circle, I mean, you're going to see it, right? But it's not going to stick out or above the other homes that surround it. That's There's exactly my, that's exactly my point. And this is only only captures one of those houses that are constructed around the property we're referring to. And mm -hmm. so again, I, I find it an arbitrary. We haven't heard all the public testimony. That's we true. We can move forward. Thank you. Hearing from the owners, the applicants. Um, and I guess you're done, right? You have. I'm you have, done. Thank you. No, not you, Norma. I mean the. Oh, I'm sorry. Bill and Susan, I'm talking about. Okay. Hi. Did Esther have a comment? I thought there was. Uh, uh, yes. I, well, I had a question uh, for the applicant. So I was trying to look at the the height of the tower in question, the entry, um, and I'm looking at one of the sections. It appears that the high, if, if as designed, um, you enter uh, from, you know, from, um, I guess, the ridge, Ridgeway side, is that 13 feet inside floor to ceiling? Inside the, um, inside the, the entryway? The entry. Um, if, uh, I believe it would be 12 feet inside because there's structure in the roof. Right. So right now, right now, I mean, right now there's a difference of 13 and a half feet from finished floor to top of roof. So, um, I mean, I, I can't or, imagine that that, it, and, and then that's what my question, am I interpreting that correctly? I mean, the roof structure can't be more than what? 12 inches, 12 14, 16, inches. 14 inches. So that still gives you, that still gives you about 13 feet inside floor to ceiling. Is that correct? It would be a standard size. It would be a standard height ceiling if we were to lower the roof. Oh, okay. So if you lower the roof, it would bring it down to eight feet? It can that, yes. Okay. Um, and it's about six foot wide, correct? Yes. Okay. So it's kind of double the right now as designed. It's double the height as the width. Yes. Okay. Which you know, I I have to say, um, this is you could tell that a lot of love and care went in and a lot of thought went into this design and I understand uh, the you know punctuation of this entry tower. Um, I, I I have to say though I think I think you can still you know you can afford to lower it a little bit and get that um, you know that feeling that grand entrance feeling that I think your father was after and, you know, make your neighbors happy. Um, maybe it doesn't have to go all the way down um, to the level of the garage, 
but I think you could still accomplish a very nice sp entry space if you lower it. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the east elevation and it is a little um, imposing compared to the rest of, of the building. It's, it's beautifully stepped down and broken down. I, I could, you know, I can't see any improvements in this design except for maybe that hour, which I, I you know, I understand the concept and the intent, but maybe bringing it down a little bit more would be a good idea for the neighbors. So it's just my comment or question and comment. Um, I do have a point. Uh, I think that the, we would need to think about how the, it affected the rhythm of the rest of the roof structure if we were to bring it down a little bit because they're proportional to- Yeah, the it doesn't- yeah, I think you could still get a little bit of umph there, you know, even if you lowered it um, so that it doesn't conflict with the roof structure of the of the garage. Anyway, it's a great project. It's beautiful. Thank you. I'm sure my father would appreciate hearing that. <laughs> okay. Any any uh, That's uh, your public comment? public feedback? We, uh, applicant. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, did Dylan and Susan have any more comments? No, uh, um, I, we we realized we I think we were trying to be very um, cognizant of the impact it would have on our neighbors, and we stayed within the height limits wherever we could from the Ridgeway property from the street level looking out. I think the visible part is a garage, and as you step back and coming up from Chester, it may be more visible. So I can understand there being a need for more foliage to kind of soften that impact. But from Ridgeway, I think there's just the visible garage structure. And I, I would like to point out that we remain eight feet below the height limit at our highest point. Right, so- um, can I'd like I, to hear from the based public. On, based on um, Commissioner Gonzalez Parber's questions and the answers, I'm a little confused, uh, so I wanted to, just to get some clarity. So on on the page like three the of public. the drawings, the one that's labeled page three, has a dotted red line at the east elevation um, showing a lowered tower. Is, is that what the final plan is? Um, it, 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 we are presenting that, that option um, I unfortunately I don't have that page in front. I, I I don't have a copy of that page. Um, <laughs> well, it's it's part of. Uh, oh. I I have never received a copy of this page. Um, okay, F Dylan, your dad prepared it. I I just I, I, yes. I assumed he had given it to you. So Dylan, what it does is it it's just showing um, where the roof would be lowered to over the stairway feature if it was brought down to the garage level. I can imagine. For the commission to see that and phil the applicants do not want to make that modification they would prefer to keep the house as it is designed staff is supporting the house as designed so mm -hmm. you you would have the commission would have to yeah. make that a condition that they redesign the building permit plans to remove that tower the um everyone wants to call it a tower but i no, refuse well, <laughs> it's a stair single stairway it's, feature it's a, it's a um... It's an yeah. eastern entry. I've been to China twice. I, I know what that means. Um, so, so you have. Um, so the other part of that discussion, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. So you're lowering it two feet, but the the but the ceiling height goes from 13 feet down to eight. Um, there, there's uh, approximately 14 inches of structure in the ceiling, so that it's. If you lower the, the exterior um, approximately three feet, then it, the interior ceiling height will be approximately eight feet. So you'd lose that 13 foot uh, aspect completely. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Can we hear from public, public members, please? Yes, we're going to the public next. If we're done with the questions for the uh, applicants, we'll go to the public. We do have one member of the Prebook, Jessica Green. Okay, thank you. Raise your hand. Jessica, would you like to speak? 
Yes, I would. Um, well, first of all, I'm wondering how many of you uh, planning commissioners actually went to the site besides looking at the piece of paper in front of you. Would you raise your hand if you went there? Okay, so two, two out of one, two, three, four. Uh, three of us. Three. Okay, well. Four. Four, I see. Because it's, it's really important, I think, to see it other than on a piece of paper, because it, 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 it's much more imposing. You know, you can go and take pictures to make things look a certain way without really seeing the reality of, of what it's like. And it really does look very tall from here. I mean, I could see if maybe they were going to make a, uh, a glass pyramid in the top so that it wasn't like you know, obstructing so much. But I think that it's, it's really kind of imposing that and you really have to go see it. You, you can't just look at a piece of paper uh, at a plan and say, well, this is a nice house, but all the houses on that side of the street are single story houses. There is a, a house across from it that's like a Victorian house that's been there forever. Uh, but this is this is another house, and and from the different angles on this street, it it just looks too tall. And I think it's very nice that this fellow has agreed to possibly take it down two feet. That 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 would make a difference um, because it really isn't in the character of the houses on that side of the street. Um, that that's. That's all I have to say about that, really. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Any other public comments? I do have one other hand raise. Marguerite Elliott, Marguerite. Hi, I'm Marguerite Elliott and I live across the street uh, from 169. And um, I really appreciate them offering to lower the tower or the garage or whatever it is, two feet, everything makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. And if when you stand at Ridgeway, you know, with the flat part where these houses are, the ridge line per se, and you look out, currently it is sticks up way above all the other houses on that side of the street. Now on my side of the street, I'm across the street. Yes, there are two houses on either side that have been there forever, a long time that are two story and houses along my side of the street. Yes, they do, they are two story, but on that side of the street, 169, all up and down, they are one story. Nothing like sticks up as high as the tower. So um, I do appreciate them offering to lower and kind of blend in more with the neighborhood. Towers are nice or whatever, but it's nice to kind of be, blend in more with the neighborhood also, because I live across the street and I work outside a lot, you know, I see people coming and going. People come up from uh, downtown Fairfax up Taylor and through the staircase with the back of my property. And they all go over there and they look. I, have, I haven't met anybody that hasn't said, geez, that's so tall compared to everything else around here. So, you know, it is out of character. But, I mean, yes, it's a beautiful design. And I do appreciate them. Um, having a beautiful design. I'm an artist and I love good architecture. And I do appreciate them offering to, to lower two feet. Everything would be, you know, I think it would look, it would go a long way. So thank you. Thank you. Good comments all. Okay, any other members I, of the public during the public? I just wanna make sure that everybody received the email that I forwarded from neighbor John Winston because I've agreed to read, I'm gonna read it if you didn't receive the email that I sent to you. Did everybody get the email December, it was dated December 13th from John Winston. He lives at 21 Chester. I may have gotten it, but didn't read it. So I would appreciate okay. you reading it. Okay. And I don't think I received it, so that'd be great. Okay, hi Linda. We had previously sent an email with our written comments regarding the proposed design. We noticed in the notes from the upcoming meeting that it says we have not responded. We will list our concerns again below. 
We have privacy concerns regarding the following. The multiple large windows only on the side facing 21 Chester on the opposite side that faces 167 Ridgeway, the windows are much more reasonable in size and seem to be positioned more appropriately for privacy. Both of the bedrooms and bathrooms at 21 Chester are facing these large windows. The large 1,376 square foot deck only wraps around on the 21 Chester side. It extends around the entire length of the home only on the side facing 21 Chester. With the revised plan, the large deck is moved only eight feet away from 21 Chester. It extends the entire length of the home and is positioned looking directly down onto the patio and only yard space at 21 Chester. On the other side facing 167 Ridgeway, there is no deck and only a small portion of the home is actually positioned 10 feet away with the majority of the home being positioned further away than 10 feet. Thank you, John and Alice Winston. Okay, no, oh, that's interesting comments all. Um, any other public comments out there before we close the public hearing period? Pamela? I do not see any other hands at this time. Okay, thank you. All right, so we will then uh, close the public hearing period on 169 Ridgeway Avenue and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Commissioners. Do you see Norma's hand up? No. Okay. No, I was just uh, on my, my head on my hand. Gotcha. I guess I'll go, I'll go ahead and speak then. Um, so my impression when I drove to the site and you're, you're facing the site is that the lots going left, it steeply slopes down going left and then kind of down the back side of the lot. And um, the properties on both sides are single story. So it, it appears kind of like this and kind of off, which makes that um, entry feature all the more prominent. And that was why I asked whether the infield things were representing the changed elevation or the proposed elevation. I felt like the, the entry as designed was, um, was too imposing and would obscure the view from the, from the property, particularly across, across the street. So I, I love the, the changed drawings. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more of staff's thinking on this letter sh she just read about the impacts to 21 Chester. I guess this is referring to the south elevation with those series of windows and I guess the deck. I'm just going to go to that floor plan really quickly. So it's always, it's always, um, difficult when you do an infill lot, when you do an infill development, especially on a small lot like this, that's narrow where the houses are all very close together. Um, it's a steep site, so there isn't a lot of usable outdoor space. Uh, so they do have decks. I would just recommend, you know, if, if, the, if the windows are an issue, there are ways to deal with that. Rather than removing the windows, you could make them opaque so that they, you know, you can't see out of them, but they still allow light in. Um, you could make them, you could require them to be clear story windows. Uh, with regards to the deck, you could put, uh, require some kind of planting screening or, you know, some kind of a uh, built in screen on the deck, but I think it would kind of detract from the design of the house. It's just, uh, it's kind of the nature of Fairfax when you're in the hillsides that you you can't expect that you're never going to see another house. And I understand if the neighbor, you know, that both properties can deal with their privacy issues, right? The new house can plant plants, the 21 Chester can plant plants. So if the commission feels that that would substantially improve the privacy issues, you could require either of those things added as conditions of approval to the resolution. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, well, that, that is an interesting problem um, about the deck overlooking another house. Uh, I had um, some concerns about the, uh, the plans and that the, um, by the way, I want to thank you guys and the staff for those pictures. One picture is worth a thousand words, and I just was not able to get up to that site. 
Um, but, um, you know, in the, first of all, yes, it's great that the uh, applicant is willing to lower the roof. Uh, it sounds like the neighbors, uh, you know, that's what the hearing's all about, to hear the neighbors and others uh, to, to, to have, have their input. And so if they're willing to do that, you know, the, the I, I feel that the project should not be disturbed as much as we can because it's this ancient design that's um, the father's design and it's all very personal, et cetera. Uh, but lowering the height, if that will make the neighbors feel happier, that's great. I'm not quite sure how we're gonna deal with the, um, the 21 uh, Chester. But my question goes to the, um, the back deck also um, and how the, how the deck is supported. There's a long, um, column there and then there's a base drawn there and I just wondered is is that is this the project where there's some shallow um, shallow bedrock staff yes it is there were no yeah the, the town engineer agreed with the report the geotechnical report so there is shallow bedrock and there was no um, uh, instability issues with this site. Okay, which so is the, rare. Back, the back deck issue is not a problem. Oh, my, my no, okay. not 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 from a stability standpoint. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, you know that was that was kind of my issue with the design, other than the height. Um, any other discussion from? Yes, uh, Commissioner Swift. I had a question for staff related to. Um, the walkways um, and, and the comment from 21 Chester. So on that side of the plans, that's just primarily on that side of the house, a walkway from door to the back. Is that correct? Are you, are you, are you talking about the deck? I'm talking about um, if you're looking or are you uh, talking about the walkway to the front door? I'm talking about um, the walk, the decking. Uh -huh, on, okay. If you're looking straight on uh -huh. to the property, the right hand side is the deck. The building is decking, but that decking it looks to me like it's more just a walkway from one door to the back to the Chester side. Is that correct? Uh. Not necessarily. I, I believe it, you know, it, it widens at one point. So it's okay. not just the narrow width of a walkway. Okay. It has some, it has some, if you look at page, um, if you look at page three of the plans, middle elevation, Yes, you can see that the deck, you know, it doesn't just follow the line of the house. It kind of goes out to a point, uh, has a little widened area. Okay, got it. Thank you. And, and I know that, you know, once the applicant, you know, was willing to center the property more than that kind of opened up the fact that this brought it closer to that 21 Chester property. Um, my comment on the central staircase feature is that I think that's just about, and the applicant mentioned it, it's just about three feet tall, just shy of three feet tall. And I think that does add, and from the comments, you know, the neighbors, it, it just adds to the, to the mass of that building, even though you're going to have um, the garage in front of it. And the applicant um, provided that the dr revised drawing with the red lines in appendix attachment B um, of what it would look like if that was flattened and that almost three feet was taken down. And I think that design change would help to reduce the impact um, of the size on the on the neighborhood, and I think it would help bring the the neighborhood more into harmony 
for the other buildings in the area as a whole. So um, I would be supportive of the project, but with that um, central staircase feature being brought down to to be reflected as it is in um, what was attached to our current staff report. Thank you. Yeah, I'm kind of in agreement with that. Um, just to, okay. Any any other uh, discussion? Mimi's got her hand up. I can't see that. Okay, Mimi, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I am torn here. Uh, I too was not able to get up. Uh, my truck couldn't get up that hill this week, so um, I did not get up there in person. But um, you know, just with with looking at the design and the changes reflected in the uh, attachment um, on page four, my. My concern is that the articulation of the roof line has been, you know, designed, uh, you know, so nicely that to bring that uh, entryway down to the level that's reflected here with this red dashed line. Um, this gives me some concerns that it would be more monolithic, you know, with uh, less articulation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great that the uh, applicants have agreed to do that. Um, but I just have some concerns that, uh, you know, we're losing something of this, uh, of the beauty here. And, um, you know, I wonder if there's a, a compromise, you know, we we're talking about a two fit re foot reduction, maybe, uh, you know, one to two foot would, would work. I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of that articulation element. So I'd love to hear if anybody else has a reaction to that. So Mimi, on uh, the plan page that was dated 12 9 look at the north elevation that is still reflecting the step down as well as the east elevation with the step down. So the elevation you're concerned about then is the west and the, the south elevation then? Is that? I mean, um, mostly it's the west elevation that, that strikes me as the, the potentially monolithic even though it's shorter but I, you know I, I I welcome other people's thoughts I you know I I tend to agree with you Mimi I I, I don't know if the compromise is one foot six you know just you don't lose um, you know that um, accent altogether but it does bring it I, I think even a foot makes a difference. Um, so I, I, you know, I do agree. I would hate to lose that feature altogether. Um, but if maybe 18 inches, um, would be a good compromise, I would support that. Um, the other thing I was going to say about the, the windows, uh, the bedroom windows, I don't, don't think we can do clear stories there because those have to be, um, egress rescue windows. So I think we would have to um, make those windows opaque. Um, I don't know about the the great room windows. It seems that by you know centering the building, we've kind of put it. Is, is that correct? We put it closer to the neighbor, the deck, uh, and those big windows are now closer to the neighbor. Um, I think that might also benefit from some, and you know, the, the applicant might find that they want some privacy too, at least on, on the middle level. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer is there, but I, I, I think it would be a shame to lose uh, this part of the design, the, you know, the big windows into the great room. Um, 
or out of the great room. So I'm not sure what the answer is there, but um, maybe somebody can offer something. Right. Okay. Um, I don't, is so we have a we have part. You know, we have this month. We've discovered now it's a it's within the uh, potentially within the uh, ridge line ordinance. Um, and I'm looking at like the north elevation, which goes up, and the south elevation, which kind of goes down. And I'm wondering, is there any way of identifying in those? Uh, I guess it's a question for staff for sure. Uh, where you know where the ridge line would be in relationship to those drawings, or is that even possible to establish? So we we drew in the road. The road at this point is on the top of the ridge line. The road in front of this house is on the top of the ridge line. Okay. And we drew we drew a red line in on which page of your attachments on the on if you look at it's labeled page four where the red line is drawn across the house and it shows you that 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 the stairway feature only goes 14 feet above the ridge. Right. Because the road is the ridge. Okay. And the okay. entire property is in the corridor. Okay, perfect. There, there's nowhere to move the house to get it out of the ridge line corridor. Right. Okay. Uh. Okay, well, I'm, I'm also in favor of minimizing the reduction in the height, but I think we need to consider that, you, you know, the, the applicant wants to live in this neighborhood and this is the design and it's not absolutely perfectly compatible with the neighborhood, but, you know, as, as modified here by the applicant, and I think you are making a good faith effort to, to try to please the neighbors and this isn't a, a little bit of an unusual design in that area. Even though I haven't been there, I looked at it on Google Maps and you can see even that, you know, what, what the area looks like. So this is a real upgrade, you know, for that area, I think. Um, you know, and you should um, more or less be able to live your father's dream. So those are my comments. So I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve yeah. resolution 2020-11. Can you hold on a second? Michelle, I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't know where where we are in terms of consensus, but uh, I did notice that in the resolution, there were some changes I wanted to make. 2020-11, um, in and very minor, but we've got um, all these general plan uh provisions cited on the first page of the resolution and uh, if we could put those in order and delete the one that we have twice uh 722 uh i think that would be helpful um if we're going to talk about replacing uh any trees with a uh what did it say? A box, a 24, um, 24-inch uh, box size native tree uh, if the, um, in the location of where the current fruit tree is, I would recommend us doing that in uh, paragraph 14 on page three of the proposed resolution. Um, depending upon what you're gonna say about the height of the uh, stairway entryway, you, you may wanna refer to additional plans in that first paragraph under the first whereas clause. Um, and you know, I don't know if, if adding requirements for uh, privacy plantings, uh, if, if we decide that that's appropriate or if you're gonna put that in your motion, but if you did, it would probably be good to just add that to the miscellaneous provisions at the end, uh, paragraph, maybe a new paragraph 50. Those are my thoughts, sorry for jumping in there. No, good, that was good. 
Well, oh. I had a couple of issues also with the, I wasn't aware, Michelle, that you were going to make a motion right then. So um, yeah. I have a couple of, uh, so I think there could be a new um, condition under, under design review call, you know, where it says tree removal, that be maybe 13A or part of 14 even, and that would be that a condition could be added requiring installation of a 24 inch box size native, um, you know, perhaps an interior live oak in parentheses tree in the vicinity of where the existing fruit tree is currently located. And then also back up in ridgeline development part of the reso, I think it's page two, um, I'm not sure if we're quite ready or if we should be referring to in number 10 at the bottom, the ridgeline development permit is necessary, et cetera, whether we should be saying visual resources map number nine slash general plan visual resources map because we're getting to that later in this meeting and we haven't changed the ordinance to say that yet. So not sure if, you know, if we can even add slash general visual general plan visual resources map. I don't, I mean, I, I would like to hear from fellow commissioners if you have a similar issue or if it's fine with all of you, I'll go with it. Okay, and then, you know, in my staff report, I forgot to tell you a couple of changes that I needed to make to the resolution. Would it be okay if I did that right now? Please do, thank you. Okay, so I meant to add, <laughs> because it's a requirement of the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor Ordinance, a number 50, that all utilities and cables shall be undergrounded. That's a requirement in the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor in accordance with the Ridgeline Development Ordinance Section 17060058A. And then one of the commissioners had also requested that um, staff do a better job of of making our standard conditions uniform throughout all our staff reports. And so we had on past staff reports had a, an expanded um, language for our dark sky lighting requirement. So I'm just going to read it and I, I wanted to add it to this, this resolution as well as to the, um, the, uh, <laughs> the Bennett House resolution. So it's the lighting about dark sky should read all exterior fixtures be dark sky compliant, fully shielded and emit no light above the horizontal plane with no sag or drop lenses, side light panels or up light panels. And the lighting plan shall be submitted with the building permit application and be approved by the planning department prior to issuance of the project building permit. The lighting shall not emit direct offsite illumination and shall be the minimum necessary for safety. And those were my only additions. Okay, those are, uh, is that replacing the paragraph? Because it takes care of a lot of issues the neighbors might have had too. A question, Linda. Please. Mm -hmm. 46. Is that what you just read to replace the existing paragraph 46? Correct. Thank you. And if I might interject briefly, uh, Chair, in regard to your comment about the visual resources map and map number nine. The reason why the visual resources map was added was, um, as your commission is aware, uh, there currently is no visual resources map number nine in any current count, town document that refers to a prior visual uh, general plan with a prior map so designated. And it was an attempt to clarify it. I mean, I, I realize that the commission is well aware of the map, but it was simply a, an attempt to say, look, this is, this is where this map exists in a current town document. Okay, that, that's fine. I mean, it's 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 not a big deal, but we just right. want I think to it's hear. it's just clarification as to what we're referring to. So I think it's good. Right, it's fine. Okay, great. So um, now I think we might be coming towards a consensus, perhaps. Um, so Michelle, if you want to raise a motion. I'm not. Uh, I'm not in support of the motion. That's just whatever just happened. So uh, that would not be me making that motion. Okay. Any other discussion? Do we have some consensus? Or you know, do we need to? Another thought possibility is: Do we need to continue this again because we have this privacy issue? Well, I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. 
you know, I apologize, Ms. Shell, for interrupting you when you were about to make a motion. Um, I was, okay. I had really <laughs> expressed my uh, concerns about the resolution. So um, I, you know, feel responsible for all this. And uh, if none of that was having to do with your motion, could you just go forward with your motion and let us react to it anyway? Michelle, do you? Uh, I'm not sure I can do this. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 2020-11, attachment A, modifying the, the reference on page one to the Fairfax general plan, reordering uh, the land use policies in numerical order, deleting the second uh, LU 7.2.2. Going on then to page three, the whereas under the conditions number one, replacing the uh, architectural plans by Alex Riley. It's now dated, um, well, see the rest of these plans would be applicable 11-1, except there'll be the elevations will, well, the, hmm, the plans will be modified to reflect the 12-9-20 requiring the, the entry feature roof be lowered down to the garage feature height, adding into this condition, referencing the general plan open space map, the 1974 visual resources map. Is that the right map? I don't even know. Um, and I am not going to add to condition number 13 the tree addition because I do not support replacing an apple tree with a 24 inch box native plant. So I'm excluding that if somebody wants to modify it. And then deleting and replacing condition number 36 regarding the dark sky criteria to the language read into the record by staff on dark sky, adding condition number 50, which is that all utilities shall be undergrounded, referring to municipal code section 17.060.0508A. Well done. That was that was really good. Any any additions, corrections, etc. Second. Well, can I interject here? I am sorry, but I lost my audio <laughs> for the last few minutes. <laughs> oh. I'm happy to do it over again. So can um, so that would be good. I um, if we could start because I did have some reso. Um, corrections as well, but I'm, I just lost all that discussion on, on um, what you all were saying as far as the central staircase and any of the Oh, other Lord. Things. Okay, I'll, t I'll tell you what. Why don't we hold the motion as is. We're waiting for a second. Well, There's a little bit of I can summarize. Huh? That would be great. Summarize for Cindy's benefit. So uh, did you hear any of the corrections that I was suggesting? No. Okay, so I went through a series of corrections on page one of the Rezo about the Here land use happen. policies. Um, I uh, suggested we uh, modify the um, paragraph 14 and, and uh, Phil suggested paragraph 13 to deal with replacing the tree. Michelle rejected that. She doesn't want to require replacing the tree. She did uh, recommend modifying the first whereas clause you know, to reflect the amended height in the 1209-20 submittal that's attached to our packages. 
and uh, she recommended modifying paragraph 46, Michelle, you said 36, but I'm gonna correct you. I think it was 46 to reflect the uh, dark sky language that's consistent with other dark sky uh, resos. And then adding a paragraph 50 uh, to reflect the utilities and cables being undergrounded per uh, Linda's recitation. Right. Okay, and, and um, on page five, number eight on the reso, did anybody address the code reference? <clears throat> which is on- um, Chapter 9.36. Which should be 8.36. Okay. And then, um, that same paragraph deleting the last sentence about requiring pruning during July or August. I think um, at the last meeting that was discussed as coming out. Anything else, Cindy? Um, and I think you, you already got the, the utilities and cables undergrounded. Yes, right. ma'am. All right, thank you. Sorry. I'll, ex I'll accept those amendments. Do, is there a second? Thank you. Uh, no, wait, I, I have I have a question about the screening, vegetative screening, uh, where the, you know, what we're talking about the big windows uh, off the deck. Are we adding anything for that? I am not proposing that. I live in the hillsides and we all take care of it however we need to. And we all have creative ways to do that. Okay. And, and since the person's not here, I don't have a chance to really ask him questions. I did read his letter. That's true. Okay. So I'm not clear on how many people agree that we should lower uh, the stair um, profile by three feet versus one foot or 18 inches. Um, I don't know if we can actually weigh in on that individually uh, just to see where everybody is with that. Well, since I'm making the well, motion to accept his right. uh, height okay. difference, which is two feet, uh, what I wrote so, it down, two feet, uh, that is the motion. If if you if I don't it's get a two second, reduce, two feet, not not three feet. Is that? I guess um, I asked him, and he said it was. Uh, where's my note? Two feet eleven point nine. Yes, two feet eleven and three quarters is what he said it was. Okay, right. So I'm going with his dad's design. His dad modified okay. it. And so if we don't agree with that, we would vote no. If I get a second. Okay. I'll second. Okay, then we need a roll call vote, please. Hi, did you call me? Yeah, my um, toddler is. No, it's Linda who's supposed to be calling a roll. She just got put to bed and is, is crying. Okay, Clark. <laughs> yes, Clark. thank you. All right, Fragoso? No, because I don't agree with the reduction of the stairwell. Okay, Gonzalez Parber? Uh, uh, no, because I also do not agree with the two foot nine reduction in the stair. Okay, uh, Newton? Yes. Swift? Yes. Rodriguez? Yes. Chair Green? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, there's a uh, appeal period for those who want it uh, of 10 days and there's a $500 fee payable to the town council for that privilege. Okay, now we're going to as modified in the agenda uh, not do part two of the amendments to town code right now, but get to 53 Taylor Drive. Does anybody want to break? Or should we just go to 53 Taylor Drive? Let's keep moving forward right now. Okay. Um, staff, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this project, this project consists, oops, do I have the right one? Oops, wrong staff report. Sorry about that. My... There it is. 
Okay, the project encompasses the construction of two accessory buildings and installation of an industrial sized emergency generator to service the Bennett House, a 70 unit apartment complex for the elderly and disabled. The largest of the two accessory buildings is a 240 square foot combination storage maintenance building and the smaller second structure will be a 144 square foot garden shed to serve the surrounding resident garden area. Also proposed is a new concrete walkway and entrance path to the storage maintenance building and a 156 square foot trellis architecturally connecting the two structures. The generator cabinet housing the generator will be seven and a half feet long by three feet wide and five and a half feet tall. If approved, the construction will require the removal of the small existing garden shed and two trees, one fig and one pear tree. Forward progress. It only took, it only took seven months. Hey, we Dylan. need to remove Dylan and Susan. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you can, right? Yes. Guys, okay. <laughs> I don't know what that talking is. Okay, so in the staff report, we pointed out the difference in the amount of maintenance and storage room area that the new the new project Victory Village has. It has fewer units than Bennett House, right? And it's it's almost twice as much area. Bennett House was built um, in what in 1986, and the maintenance and and um, servicing of the building were handled by outside contractors. They now do it in-house. They have full-time staff that's there doing, you know, fixing up and addressing um, residents' concerns and they really, really need some additional space. Adjacent development to the Bennett House includes residential development of single family homes to the southeast along Klaus and Taylor Drives Fairfax Market and an, and an old gas station building that's been the home to various uses since the gas station closed to the west, St. Rita's Church property to the north and to the east an undeveloped parcel that's owned by the town. The southwest corner of the property touches the Marin Bicycle Museum property. So it's the, pro the property is zoned oh. plan development district and any new construction in a plan development district requires a design review permit from the planning commission. The design review ordinance doesn't actually contain any legally required findings, but what it does is it sets forth criteria that you're to use in reviewing any new construction projects. And briefly, they are the following. Uh, the proposed development shall create a well-composed design harmoniously related to other facilities in the immediate area and to the total setting as seen from the hills. Only elements of design which have a significant relationship to the exterior appearance of the structures and facilities shall be considered. The proposed development shall be of a quality and character appropriate to and serving to protect the value of private and public investments in the immediate area. There shall exist sufficient variety in the design of the structures and grounds to avoid monotony and external appearance. The size and design shall be considered for the purpose of determining that the, stru that the structures are in proportion to their building site and that they have balance and unity among their external features and the extent to which the structure conforms to the general character of other structures in the vicinity. There are also no specific setback regulations in the plan development district. It says that you use the setbacks for the, for the zone that's most similar to the development that's existing there. And so the most similar zone is the multiple family residential zone. And the, propo the proposed project will comply with all the setbacks uh, required for the RM zone district, which it's most similar to, except the, um, the emergency generator is a little bit too close to the one side property line, but the owners have agreed, the owners, the applicants and the owners have agreed that they can shift it over so it, that it will comply with the required setbacks. Um, some commissioners have expressed concern about the location and the noise that might be generated by the generator, but the, the generator actually has pretty much been located um, over 136 feet from the backyard areas of the residential properties that front on Taylor and Klaus. And there's, you know, grade changes and bushes and planters and quite a bit of uh, vegetation and paths between the backyards and the generator location. So I actually think they've placed it kind of as far away as they can get it without um, 
you know, putting it right up against the side of the of the units, right? The units at Bennett House. They will match the. They're going to match the colors of the building and the roof, uh, and the trim. The buildings will match the existing Bennett House development. And I do actually like the trellis feature that kind of ties the two buildings together. And therefore, we're recommending that you approve application 2015 by adopting resolution 2020-12, which sets forth the findings and the conditions. And I will repeat that I want to, I'm recommending that you do, uh, include the more extensive language regarding the requirement for the dark sky compliant lighting. And in this resolution, it's actually uh, condition number 14. Would you like me to read it again? Am I seeing yeses? I'm seeing some no's, some yeses. Yes. Okay. I won't read it then. Okay. And that concludes our report. I was muted. Sorry. Any questions for staff from the commissioners? Thank you for the report. Looks like Norma has a question. Norma. Thank you. <clears throat> Linda, can you tell me, uh, can you clarify for me, is there a requirement that the generator sit five feet or more beyond any adjacent property line? Um, I think it's actually 10 feet away from the side property line. You mean you mean in the RM zone? Or are you saying uh, generators in general? Uh, both in general and in this specific location. Yeah, for this property, the setback from the side property line where it's located is actually 10 feet. Um, it's the, uh, excuse me, the setback is 10 feet or the requirement uh -huh. is for a 10 foot setback? requirement is for a 10 foot setback so where you see it on the plans it's going to have to be shifted over uh okay so like four i can't remember exactly how many feet but they've agreed but that's, that's not a problem for them right they have the space but it is required to be 10 feet in right. other places in town is there a, a re setback requirement for a generator you know i haven't read the new uh -huh generator ordinance so i'm i um ben, ben can you ben you attend the uh council meetings right ben are you there yes okay i i i know that someone was trying to get a generator ordinance proposed but i don't know if it ever went through or if there were setback regulations in the emergency generator ordinance do you know if that ever happened nothing no, no vote was taken to, okay. to create an ordinance yeah. So, so right now, um, Norma, the the generators would just have to maintain whatever setbacks are required for structures in whichever zone they're proposed in. Most oh, okay. Our, that yeah, most that our, yeah. That gives me an answer. So, if there's a five foot setback for any structure, any generator would also be required to sit back five feet right. from a property line. Right. All over town. Right. Are generators required to have an enclosure at this property and at any property in town? So since, they, since the council didn't adopt an emergency generator ordinance that puts out specifications, I don't believe there's any requirement. This, these people are proposing an enclosure for it, but I don't know whether the building code or um, the building code might have some kind of a requirement requiring them to be you know, I don't know that much about generators. I assume they need some kind of protection from the weather and the and the elements, you know? So I think they must come with some kind of a cabinet. Okay, did you say this project is proposing an enclosure? Yes. Okay. It has a cabinet and, around it, yep. Right, and can you also clarify, does the property have solar installed? I saw solar panels on the plans, but somewhere, I wasn't sure if they were uh, actually installed. Yeah, they have them on the roof. 
Okay. Have them on the roof of the existing three-story building. Okay. Uh, all right. I I have numerous questions about the generator and uh, it, its power source. I'm not sure. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and ask you. And if you think I should ask the applicant instead, uh, I will do so. Uh, this generator will be tied to their natural gas line. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Was there any discussion with the applicant since they have solar uh, to do some sort of a power wall to provide emergency power as opposed to a gigantic generator? You're gonna to have to ask them that question. Okay, um, One of the commissioners asked a question about could the could the generator be powered by solar and the applicant did send a response to that, but but yours question about, yeah, I, you're gonna to have to ask them. I'm sorry, can you tell me, I couldn't see that response about powering with solar. Can you tell me what they uh, responded? I'll, yeah, I'll read it. It says the Bennett house currently has solar located on the roofing surface that supports elements common areas of the site the rest of the roof contains additional items such as building equipment um, and an, and in addition has very little space to begin with given the roof elevations and shed pitches we did they did look into additional solar however after going through exhaustive evaluations with our solar consultants and it was determined that the additional solar was still not enough to power up the elevator for our senior residents. Given this outcome, this was when we decided to look and work towards the natural gas generator as it would and does support this along with other needs. They, they went on to say, we have and will continue to explore additional solar on site. However, this would require parking canopies over all of the stalls. This will come at an additional cost, which given our funding for the current rehab project and upgrades is not feasible. Our hope is to continue to explore any alternative financing sources that may capture this. However, there is no timeline established at this time. Okay, thank you, Linda. Good question. That was all my questions. Okay, thank you. Any other questions here for staff? Um, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> staff, so part of this project, does it involves the paving? The pathway, yeah, the pathway to the uh, yes, and you know I recall from previous planning meetings that the type of uh, concrete used in our sidewalks is uh, they're like preferred types of concrete to use to help prevent people from slipping when they're wet or to allow for more porous concrete. Do you know anything about that in terms of like the town sidewalks and stuff like that? Um, I I was not, no, I'm not up on the town sidewalks. I, I know that we, we have been very particular about the level of lamp black that's used in certain areas of town because uh, we wanted it to match some of the older sidewalks, but I'm not aware that we include any kind, any kind of special concrete to prevent slippage but if you're if you're concerned about this sidewalk i would talk to the applicants about it maybe they're already proposing something that will keep you know people from slipping if it's wet is that what your concern was that perhaps they could use something similar or something well i have a combination of concerns um just one being uh the the slipping you know and and this being uh a home for older people, I, I really would hope we would uh, make sure that it's um, as safe as possible. And, and then the other issue being more in terms of permeability, I guess. And I see Ben has turned on his camera like he knows something about this issue and wants to say something about it. Well, uh, uh, Chip, Commissioner Newton, I was just going to comment that I am aware that there are certain standards for, uh, and I'm not sure if it's a slip coefficient or something, but uh, regarding your concern that there are 
there are some standards for that. And so we could possibly add a requirement that it be uh, designed uh, so that it has a maximum or minimum slip coefficient or something. And we can work on whatever it is. I'm not sure the specific standard, but I am aware that there are there is concern paid to that um, in various materials. Yeah. And I think you should ask the applicants because you know they get funding from all kinds of sources and I'll bet that their their people are probably all over making sure that everything is safe. I he may have an answer. They may already have be proposing what you're concerned about. Right. I mean the ADA also plays a role in paving yep. for this mm -hmm. place too, because it's kind of a public <coughs> residence. So right. They have to get um, insurance and <coughs> okay, thank you. Um well, before we ask the applicant to address any issues, um, are there any more questions for staff? From any of us? No? Okay. Thank you, then. Um, we will move on to the applicant. And if they'd like to make a presentation and receive some questions, this is the time. Thank you. Are they are they in attendance? Tamala? Yes, I'm making them. I'm they're coming live right now. <coughs> Bear Clow. Come here, sweetheart. Matt and John have both been allowed to speak. John has his hand up. Would he like to go first? Hi, this is John. Um, uh, as far as uh, sidewalk safety, we're happy to meet any requirements that may be found. And John, can you clarify just who you are relative uh, to the John project? Vignelli with I'm John Vignelli with TWM Architects. Um, I just, uh, if there are requirements for, um, safety requirements for the sidewalk where you were happy to meet any uh, conditions of approval that may be required. Well, even if, even if not required, I mean, one, one thought we've gone through, if I may ask you, is, is permeable paving to allow water to go through. Um, I don't know if this is an issue with that, but uh, that's something to consider. Um, any questions for John uh, from uh, anybody? Okay, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. Hey, thanks for um, coming. My focus is on the generator. And um, I guess first I wanted to talk a little bit about the use of natural gas. Um, so from, I guess, um, from my perspective, from a greenhouse gas initiative standpoint, this is the next frontier for Fairfax, um, and I'd really like to encourage the Planning Commission to initiate as part of a work plan, um, a prohibition of con new construction, including natural gas and a requirement that existing natural gas be converted um, to electrical. So I'm not in support of natural gas from because of that. Second, just a generator overall. Um, I feel like solar and utilizing the sun's energy and capturing that um, in a battery storage is the way to go because I do believe that, that Marin is on a single grid and we can expect future outages. And I think it's very smart to try to put in some kind of an emergency backup system. I, I just think that the generator is a higher greenhouse gas, higher noise solution, and just higher in terms of area than, than a battery um, backup. And I understand from your response um, a couple of different things. One is that the battery backup would be used only to supplement, excuse me, only when the power is out in town, not to supplement power, that it would be tested 20 minutes weekly, uh, that the decibel level is 83.5, 
without an acoustical enclosure in 70.1 with an acoustical enclosure. And I heard Linda read about the solar um, assessment. Have you, how much additional solar would be necessary in order to power this thing? Um, could we put solar on the proposed structures and instead, and have a battery backup as part of the proposed structure versus, and would that meet the total calculation? I'm not, not clear how far you're off from the existing solar use to power the buildings and the gap for battery backup. That's the question. That's a long way of saying I'm not in support, I'm in support of the project overall. I'm just not in support of this method for the, for the backup of, of power for them. Although I recognize the need for emergency backup. That's right. Um, our engineers have studied the problem and or studied the, uh, the loads that we feel are necessary um, to maintain during the rolling blackouts or uh, loss of power during inclement weather. weather. And uh, a generator is really the only way for us to meet that at this time. We haven't studied um, capturing solar power for uh, battery backup. Uh, as um, our response indicates that uh, carports or um, would need to be installed at this point. And uh, we haven't studied uh, the extent of what would be needed to meet the requirements for the life safety measures that we're trying to cover during rolling blackouts or loss of power. Uh, we decided in a design charrette um, to go with natural gas because we are located so closely to residents and a school and felt that that was the best alternative that is available at this time. Um, that's the best answer I have for you at this, at this moment. This is Matt. If I may, um, Rich Cirillo with Mercy is also um, part of this call. He, he may be able to answer this a little bit better. Um, not, not that John didn't, um, but he can add a little bit more um, background um, as Rich was involved from the very beginning of the project. Uh, I believe he has his hand up. Would that be allowable? No, oh, absolutely. Thank you. And Rich has been unmuted. Go ahead, Rich. Hi, this is Rich Sorallo with Mercy Housing. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Real Estate Development. And yes, I've been involved with this project from the beginning. And um, you know, the questions that are coming up are very good. And actually a lot of the same questions that we had early on because uh, we definitely weren't really that keen on this, this big piece of equipment uh, as sort of a long-term solution. But the problem that we ran into is that the, the primary goal of this backup power that we were looking for is to serve serve the elevator in the and you know if, if the power were to go out, uh, which we've had you know happen with the rolling blackouts and and such. And the, the problem we ran into is that in order to power the elevator, we needed a, a significant amount of startup power, and we couldn't achieve that with uh, photovoltaics or even like uh, battery backup that would can be connected to our photovoltaics. And so we were left with the only option of going to a, a gas generator like this one in order to service the elevator. If we didn't, if we weren't trying to serve the elevator, we wouldn't need this generator. Rich, uh, let me ask you a question on that point then. Sure. And so you could, so right now you have an emergency, two questions. One is your residents, they're required to have a certain amount of mobility to live there. Is that correct? I don't know that required um, would be the right word. I mean, they they are in, it's independent living. Uh, so, you know, they, and this is a multi-story building. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of part of the how, the, how the property is set up. And so the existing emergency plan uh, includes not using the elevator, right? Because currently you cannot power the elevator under that uh, condition, an emergency condition, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any, any other uh, questions for the applicant or comments from the applicant? Yes, I, I have one, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I had to step away for a second and I, I missed whether or not you already addressed my question about the uh, concrete paving and the uh, 
so I apologize if you already addressed that. Mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. I, I did want to find out if you're uh, taking steps to ensure that both the concrete is not slippery and uh, I just had questions about the uh, porosity of, yeah. uh, of the concrete. I mean, John, our, our architect did address it, but I, I, I'm happy to kind of chime in a little bit, which is um, I don't think we, and John, please correct me if I've got this wrong, that we looked at, um, you know, like a permeable concrete for those areas. Um, you know, usually that, that does come at a cost premium, but I think it's something that we could look into um, for sure. And I think the, the other piece would be on in terms of the slipperiness of the concrete, I think that's a, a very good uh, thing we should be looking into and see if there's a, you know, a mix or a finish uh, to the top of the concrete that would reduce, you know, the, the slipperiness. I, I don't think that we have, there was a mention of, you know, some of our funding requirements. Um, there, there's nothing specific that I'm aware of that, that would call out for, you know, a specific, uh, you know, slip coefficient or something like that, you know, beyond whatever is, is code compliant, you know, in a, any given jurisdiction. But given that this is a senior property, I think that it would be, uh, it would behoove us to, to look into that and, and, you know, try to pick a finish that, that would reduce, you know, the opportunity for someone to slip. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, if I might comment again, I, while, while people were on other items, I did do some quick internet research and uh, there is uh, something called the high wet static coefficient efficient of friction. Um, and they pointed out that a broom, a typical broom finish where they take a broom while the slurry is still wet and, and it gives it that kind of that lined out finish um, has a very high uh, coefficient of friction. So I think we could easily come up with a condition for that. Okay. Yeah. And a broom finish should be pretty straightforward for, you know, the, the installer to, to do. Yep. Right. Right. Okay. Commissioner Fergoso. Thank you. Uh, for the applicant, I believe there's also a permeable concrete, is there not? That in yes. fact comes in four by four squares, just like your regular concrete pavers. It's permeable, uh, so the water doesn't sit there. It's also a little softer, has a bit of bounce to it, so if someone falls, they won't break something, and uh, it is somewhat slip proof as far as I know. That might be something for you to look into. Yeah, and, and I think that my, my experience with permeable concrete is, is limited in that when we've looked into it in the past, and this is you know a few years ago for sure, we ran into issues with fire departments, uh, like having issues like driving over it and you know, have, they're thinking about their equipment. In this instance, you know, we're talking about a walk close to a garden. I don't think they we're talking- about driving it. Right, right. So I, I think um, I, I would ask that you know we be given sort of the latitude to look into that, and I think it would be, uh, I, and I think some of the permeable concrete, the way it works, is it's also kind of a mix or, or the way that it's poured that allows it to be uh, permeable. Uh, that we can look into that. Um, the only thing I guess I would ask is to make, if if it's possible to not make it a condition uh, just in case we can't afford it, <laughs> is is really my concern. Um, but I think. You know, it, it's a. It would be a better solution, especially kind of around this garden area. Um, and personally, I'd like to see that if, if again, if we can afford it. But um, I'm not. I'm not sure, but I don't think there's a huge cost differential. But something to look into. For sure. Right. I mean, on that regard, we've discussed in the past um, sidewalks in front of houses using permeable paving stones. I'm not sure about pourable concrete, but you'll, you'll check on that. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, any other uh, questions for the uh, applicant before we open for public comment? Okay, seeing none then, uh, thank you. And uh, we will uh, <clears throat> open this uh, project for public comment, uh, Tamala. Yes, I see one hand raised. Fred. Ready. Ready. This is your chance. Uh, we have we're neighbors. 
we share um, our backyard is up against the uh, the Bennett House parking lot and the garden, and we have been plagued with noise for the entire project. I think it's well over a year of not only building and hammering, but but you know trucks backing up. I mean, they don't seem to, to go forward, but just that beep beep beep, and it's just it's exhausting. And the idea of adding two more structures to the um, the existing project seems like it's I where we just feel like when is it going to end um, we're worried about the, the fact that the cars the so many spaces during the construction the, the parking spaces at Bennett House have been um, covered now with uh, storage buildings and out there off that that they're parking in our neighborhood and we can tolerate some of that, but it's it's getting to be quite old and frustrated, frustrating. Uh, I retired last year and I was looking forward to living a <clears throat> leisurely life, but every day at eight o'clock, they start hammering. And obviously they've never heard of a nail gun because one nail takes them eight times to hit it in. And it's taking them over a year now, or more, maybe two years. But the, the point is they never end. And I'd like to sleep for five hours one night without being woken up at, at eight o'clock in the morning every single day. And I don't know who they hired to do this project but they're doing a really terrible job. Plus, like my wife said, they took away at least 10 parking spaces out of their parking lot. And instead, they're taking up the spots in front of all of our houses. We're already in the driveway and blocking our own driveways. We'd like to be able to park in front of our own house again. And for them to start building new ones. And this generator, it's going to be 10 feet from my house. That's your big, has to be away, 10 feet. We can hear it for hundreds. They can hear them hammering on the very top house on the top of Roca. You can hear them hammering up there. And I live 10 feet away. They are the biggest noise polluter in our neighborhood, bar none. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any, any other comments from the public? We yes, I do see on. two more hands. Next would be Eliza. <laughs> Eliza, I believe, is, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. You're, you have been allowed to speak? Hello, yes, this is Eliza. I'm sorry, Eliza. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, my apologies. I was lowering your hand and accidentally muted you. Please do go ahead. Um, yes, I'm also directly adjacent to the Bennett property. Um, Bennett House. I recently moved here and I have to agree with my neighbors. Um, I had no idea that I was moving into a construction zone actually when I purchased this house. Um, the, there are large bins right up against my property uh, multiple times a week. They dump uh, large amounts of debris often with dust that goes over my entire property and into, into my windows. Um, so my concern with the additional construction is, is it going to extend how long uh, the Bennett House property is under construction, um, including the noise and the parking issues that my neighbor also raised. Okay, thank you very much. And I think we have uh, Liesl Blash. Yes. Lazel? Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes, this is Liesl Blash. I live in Fairfax. I just wanted to say that I'm happy to see the move towards getting a generator. I personally am not happy with generators, but um, considering the uh, people who live in the building and the amount of press and hoopla that has been made about the lack of the generator and the need for that generator to uh, run the elevator for people who you know, are literally trapped in their apartments when there have been power outages, um, I'd like to see, um, you know, I hope there's not gonna be some long delay in getting that generator in there just since we don't really know when there will be another power outage due to whatever reason. Um, so I'm just hoping that you can come up with a good solution to um, make sure the generator goes in relatively soon. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, doesn't look like, it doesn't look like we have any other attendees raising their hands for this project. Can you confirm? That is correct. I do not see any other raised hands at this time. Okay. Then um, seeing none, we will close the public hearing period and bring it back to the commission for comments. Commissioners. I guess I would still stick to what I brought up initially, which is that I'm not in support of natural gas or, or a uh, generator. I don't feel like they fleshed out the solution regarding solar at the site enough. I have, uh, it's not clearly in their response, either in writing or tonight. So I'm in support of the rest of the application, but not the generator. Okay, thank you. Other commissioners? Hi, um, Commissioner Clark here. Um, so I don't, I, I see that the applicant is um, is gone now, but I think those, the first two public comments we heard, there's been a big construction project going on at Bennett House for quite a while. Um, and I am also curious as to if this, you know, how long the construction would be extended with this, um, you know, the new addition of these two outbuildings. Um, I do think it's really important as a senior, um, facility to have access to, to the elevator when um, there are power outages. And so, you know, I, I know that maybe it's, it's not a perfect solution, but I do think that that's really important and that we should honor um, the wish of the owners to um, make that accessible to the people who live there. And so just to be clear, I'm not trying to not have that be clear. I'm looking for an alternative energy source than a gas powered generator, just so it's clear. I want the elevator to work. Right, okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> any, any other comments before I put my two cents? Yeah. Uh, yeah sir, Commissioner Newton. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering about the, the, the technology for generators. Um, my neighbor uh, had one generator during our uh, longer outage last year and it was very loud. But then since then he's purchased one that was much quieter. And, uh, you know, we had a, a, a brief briefer outage earlier this year. And uh, it was amazing how much quieter his uh, generator was. Now, I don't know, I haven't asked him about, you know, the fuel or, or how, you know, I assume he's got a, a gas generator. But um, I'm just wondering if Commissioner Rodriguez, if you know about the the volume associated with, uh, you know, a more climate friendly technology and, and what you know about those issues. I didn't have the chance to research this. So in terms of, is your question, is there generators that don't use natural gas? Yes. Is there, a, 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 do I know whether solar can power um, an elevator, I have no idea. That's not something I had time to research before the meeting. Well, and I guess the other follow-up for me was, do we know if some of the, you know, less uh, climate harming 
technologies out there are also able to uh, operate with, you know, less noise. So, you know, that combination of, uh, you know, something that's more climate friendly and something that's more neighborhood friendly. Right, okay, Commissioner Fergoso. Thank you, Chair. Uh, briefly, I can share uh, a few things I've learned in trying to uh, have alternate power at my house as well. My first inclination, of course, was to put solar on the house because if you have sufficient solar, you don't need the natural gas generators. You can buy the Tesla power walls that are powered with solar and uh, I'm sure they can run an elevator, but you may need several of those power walls. One power wall that's about three by five is $7,000 uninstalled. They have to get installed to your main power line. At my house, which is a thousand square feet, it's a tiny little house, I do not have solar. I'm looking at installing two Tesla power walls that would run my fridge and my sump pump and maybe my heater when the power's out if all of those aren't running at the same time. They run about 7,000 a piece. I need two of them and it costs about five, six, seven thousand dollars to do the electrical to hook them up to my main power line. However, because there's no solar option, those generators will only run for a couple of days. And so I can run the house for two days, but after that, the power batteries are depleted and you have to wait again until you have power to charge them up through regular uh, PG&E outlets. And that takes a couple of days to charge them up. So uh, I think that there are very limited options for uh, commercial facilities unless you move into, I have installed gigantic power batteries that cost $50,000 in an apartment building to generate uh, the level of power that's required. So um, unfortunately at this time, uh, there are options, but they are, are costlier. The best thing would be for them to install sufficient solar, but again, as the owner and manager said, uh, installing solar panels is also uh, expensive. So that's, that's my familiarity. So while I am, I am not happy with the natural gas generator, uh, this is a, a facility that requires that the elevator function at all times and uh, if none of us can come up with a better solution, then uh, at, at this point, I don't see another option for them. As much as I, uh, as much as I don't like it. All right. My my thought is, if if everybody in Fairfax had generators, um, and and there tend to be these power outages tend to be during fires. We would have a lot of smoke and pollution. And I walked around my neighborhood, just since we're relating personal uh, personal experiences, I walked around my neighborhood during the last couple of power outages. Several of my neighbors had generators. They're all noisy. Um, one of them is quieter than others, and I'd like to find out what that is. But <clears throat> this is an issue. Um, I think that my personal feeling is though the natural gas choice for a generator power is probably the least polluting 
um, and it's a sure source of constant fuel. So, you know, it's going to run more than one day, two days. It's going to just run. Um, there are professional generators, and it's probably what they're thinking of. So, what kind? Um, you know, I assume it's going to be some one of these large generators that's encased in its own sort of uh, housing, and then that will go inside um, a building. So the, the noise level might not be that great, but there has to be an exhaust out of that building and that could create some noise. And we have neighbors who have complained. My, my general tendency here would be to continue this project um, to look to have the Bennett House look into the possibility of solar plus battery. Um, I also don't believe the battery are going to serve the elevator that well, but, you know, it's a matter of fundraising and uh, further exploration. Also, the County of Marin recently put on a program, uh, I think it was, um, was it MMWD? I'm not sure. There was a program, I think the PowerPoint is still available, um, and it compares solar to generator for back up your house. And there's all kinds of statistics, um, data in that. And I have it, I believe I could send it around. Um, <clears throat> so there is, there is quite a bit of data the County of Marin has picked up and put online. And I would uh, request that you explore that. So my, my idea here would be to continue this project um, at least another month for that exploration to occur, so for us to, you know, get into Michelle's idea about um, solar energy, and we, we need to look that up, and and maybe uh, and maybe somebody from Bennett House is still here. I think John's still here, and he's heard what the neighbors are saying about the noise, and this is a real issue um, that they seem to have because they came personally, and that means a lot to us. At least it does to me. So I think we should continue this project. Anybody else on that idea? Or another idea? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Commissioner Rodriguez. No, okay. Anybody else feel likewise? There. Commissioner Swift has her hand raised. Yes, Commissioner Swift. And I'm sorry, I'm still having technical difficulties, but I'm in favor of this project and um, supporting it and hopefully approving it tonight. Um, they have done the research on this. I've read the emails. I think a standby generator to support um, Bennett House is needed to provide the power to for the elevator and all the other needs we saw that um, clearly when we had our extended PSPS and I think it's a health and safety issue um, for that community so I'm in support of um, moving this forward and and I approve I would approve this project tonight okay anyone else uh, yes, I'm also in support of this project. I, I don't think there are many alternates out there for commercial grade generators. I think with all the, um, you know, the, the power outages, it is a very important uh, safety issue uh, at the Bennett House. So I, I, would, I would support and approve this. Okay, good, solid. Uh, Thanks. <clears throat> through the chair, a point of clarification. So, yes. The an enclosure is included in the plans for the generator, right? I believe. Verify it with the applicant, but it's described as being housed inside a cabinet. Okay. Yeah. We have a drawing of it on the. Uh, sort of the blow up it's the last attachment that includes <clears throat> the location of the pear and fig tree and you can also see uh the generator location written in red uh on the 
top of the page and you know where the gate is for the garden area. Right. You know, which strikes me that the generator is closer to the Fairfax market uh, than it is to the neighbors and, and it sounds uh, or it's proposed, you know, to be closer to that Fairfax market area. Um, and, and not on the, the side where the neighbors on Taylor are. Um, I see that. I see that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm slowly being uh, talked into uh, the health and safety issue being uh, more prominent, perhaps, than any other at the moment. Another idea, of course, is we could add to the rezo that, well, it just is the case, that if the, if the neighbors think that the generator is used and it makes too much noise, then <laughs> and we could review Hysterical. if that happens. If you uh, look I at- I really prefer to see a solar option, which I would add as a condition to the permit that the solar option be explored, even allowing the installation of a generator and that as soon as possible, it be replaced if possible. That's an option. But as a generac, um, so I don't know, can, is there nobody here from the applicant? We don't know. Is, is so the staff is it is this generac? I've seen it. There is one in the neighborhood, not quiet. Um, is it in a, a shed also? It does have a, like a body around it, you know, to protect it, the motor and all that from the weather. You can does see it, on plan right, page A32. Does it have a, a housing around it also, a building? No. You can see. You, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. You're going to say the same thing I'm trying to say. <laughs> you say it because. Okay. If you look at page A, A3.2, it shows you the cabinet that's going to be around the generator at the top of the page. Right. And they provided information. Uh, in the email that showed the difference in the decibel levels with the cabinet and without the cabinet. They are proposing to put it in the cabinet. Right, so they- the, gener the generator is going to be 10 feet from the Fairfax market. It's going to be at the very far corner of the property by the parking, over 136 feet away from the adjacent neighbor residential houses. How far away from the building, from, from the elevator, let's say? Uh, I can measure that real quickly. Okay. Is that important? I'm sure they're, they're putting it. Well, here it, it can be. I mean, the the, long, the further it is from the elevator, the more resistance you're going to get out of the wire needed to get the power to the elevator. So. Well, if they move it over by the elevator, it's closer to the houses. Yeah. So, if they move it over by the elevator, it's going to be. It's only, a chair. If they move it by the elevator, it's only going to be 64 feet away from a from the closest house on Taylor, and and it is right now It's about 300 feet away from the elevators right now. So, but their their engineers looked at the location and everything. I mean, they didn't right. just I, I choose understand. the location, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Through through the chair, it seems to me yes. that thank you. It seems to me that the elevator. I'm sorry, the generator is in a good spot on the site because it is not adjacent to the residential neighborhood, but to the parking and the commercial market, which is better than were it closer to the neighborhood. The, the casing that comes built into the generator itself does not attenuate the noise they must build a separate enclosure 
in order to attenuate the noise of a generator this size. Right, they're doing that. So I'm, yes. I'm satisfied with that problem. Uh, and where, but you know, so, okay. So does uh, anybody care to make a motion or motion for continuance or um, are we, are we, Cindy, did you want to make a motion or? Uh, sure, I'll go ahead and do that. I'd like to um, move that we approve resolution 2020-12, a resolution of the Fairfax Planning Commission approving application number 20-15 for design review and tree removal permits for maintenance shed, garden shed, and industrial generator at 53 Taylor Drive, the Bennett House Senior Housing Apartment. Um, with one correction, page three, number seven, um, just correcting the spelling of clause. Klaus, okay. I would like to offer a friendly amendment to that motion um, on page three. Uh, Please come before. in. Please on do. page three of the resolution at the top of 43B to add a uh, subparagraph 3A uh, that would uh, require that the uh, design of the concrete uh, portions of the uh, project uh, promote proper drainage. Uh, either by uh, use of a sufficiently permeable material or uh, other design, uh, as well as ensure um, appropriate precautions for ensuring anti-skidding, anti-slippage. Or high friction coefficient, we could say. I'd accept that friendly amendment. And, and with that, I would second your motion. I'd like to make another amendment. Michelle, you go ahead and then I'll make a comment as well. Um, because they responded to my noise level question. Their response was that a level two acoustic enclosure would be included and they referenced a model SG080 which is a 9.0 L. And so I think, and they said that the generator would only be used for emergency power outage. So you may want to include those two requirements. Okay, th those sound like good ideas. I, I would like um, to leave my resolution with a friendly amendment of Commissioner Newton and not include those two. Do we have a discussion about that? I mean, that's going to be, I would assume, in the building plans and specs that go forward. Hi, I think it's reasonable to require the, the generator only be used in cases of emergency, like power outages. Um, uh, if I the the chair, the I also please. would agree with that. Well, the, the Rezo says the project- well, They do have to test. Correct. In What's order that? to make sure that it works during a, an outage, you have to do the test. Uh, Linda could uh, comment. I think we test our town hall generator at least every other week. But it's only for half an hour, right? Right. It's not, yeah, even, it's half, it's not even half an hour. It's 10 minutes at town hall. And I think they're, they indicated that for a building, you know, town hall is a lot smaller. They were going to have to run it for maybe 20 minutes once a week to-, to so how, how would they test this? I mean- um, They turn it on. They turn it on. Shut down the power of the building, run it, see if it powers the elevator, shut it off, turn on the building again. What would they be doing? No, they, they, just, they just turn it on to make sure it's functioning, right? Like our, our generator, like we've had some issues with it, like things have worn out. And so we discover that during our tests, we test it on Mondays. If it doesn't go on, then we get the generator repair guy out to figure out why it isn't operating. Well, so that if we, if we do have an emergency, it will be running. 
Well, and you know, I think that's we, part we, of normal maintenance of this type of equipment. I agree. It's just the, the frequency of testing and the, I guess if we, so my, my feeling is let it go forward. And then if neighbors complain about noise at some point, we'll know. But I think the idea that, um, so the, the Rezo all, all already says it's for emergency use. But if we want to, I think the idea of a condition that it's only to be used, you know, full bore in an emergency is not a bad condition to add. That's my feeling about Again, that. Again, they're going to have to test it. It's regular maintenance. The Rezo says the purpose is for emergency use. I, I would not want to add anything else to that. I think it stands on its own. Okay. Well, we can argue. Through, through the chair. Yes or no. Um, through the so chair. We have, we have um, motion pending. I'm, I'm, if, if it's you, regarding the motion. Okay. Um, first of all, can we add the construction times to the resolution? Um, so right now, right now you have a motion on the floor. You can make you can make friendly amendments that the person that made the motion either will accept or not accept. My my there friendly amendment would be my friendly amendment would be that we add the allowed construction hours. I'm not sure what they are. Is it 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, 9 to 4 Saturday and Sunday? Is that correct? That's correct. And on holidays, it's 9 to 4. Thank you. I would like to add that to section. Um, during construction process, section three, it has uh, B, D. is that correct? Section three has B, C, this would be D. Well, and an one other there. thing on the motion, uh, Commissioner Swift asked for approval of resolution 20-12, and yet the title uh, has a design review permit application number. Do we also need that or just the resolution number, just for clarification? I think we would just do the resolution number. It encompasses all the aspects of the resolution. Okay, so I would just add- uh, It refers to the application number, so by number. Right. We're referring to application number 2015 and resolution 2020-12. Thank you. That's how I believe it should be stated. And I believe that's how I stated it. No, okay. ma'am. Are we going? Are we going on with the motion? Uh, do you accept the friendly amendment, um, Commissioner Swift? To add the um, construction hours, yes. Okay. So and, and I would say, as long as those, um, because this. Bennett House already has, has been ongoing with construction. So I would, and Linda, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the hours um, that apply to the rest of the work that's um, being done on Bennett House is the same hours that, would, that we would be adding to this reso. Is that correct? Yes, I, I yes. There okay. There are no different hours for Bennett House. Yeah. All right. I accept that. Okay. Thank you. I mean, we, we sure have to hope the applicant hears the neighbor's comments because if they can curb the banging and let people sleep, it would be it would be nice. I mean, you are a religious order. It would be just nice to exercise some of that um, soulful idea to allow people to sleep. Okay, thank you. We can go on with the, we have a second? Yes, I will second. Okay. okay. I'll call the roll. Thank you. Clark? Yes. Fragoso? Yes. Gonzalez-Parber? Aye. Newton? Yes. Swift? Yes. Rodriguez? No. I'm supporting the maintenance shed and the garden shed, but I am not in support of a commercial size generator using natural gas. I think it's a contributor to greenhouse gas. It's too noisy and they have not provided adequate information on an alternative 
a, a process or a, a combination process. Okay, Chair Green? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, thank you. And there is an appeal period of 10 days and a $500 fee for that payable to the town council. Thank you very could, much. Um, could we take a break at this time? Uh, let's just take a five minute break. Hi, well, everyone. Like that too, Unless so anybody I can really object. Technical yes. problem. Okay. Um, just quickly, I have an early morning tomorrow at work. And so I'm going to need to leave you guys now. Um, so good night and thank you. Good night and have a pleasant tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs> um, we still have a quorum, so we will continue after a five minute break. Let's get going. We've got a we'll lot to uh, a dig into. Project, which is the third project, just before we get into the ordinance, the map ordinance, <clears throat> we're going 18 Napa Avenue application number 20 16, and the staff report, please. Okay. Oh, this one is interesting. Okay. The proposed project consists of raising the existing two unit building up by five feet to elevate the lower level above the 100 year flood water elevation, legalizing and expanding the existing 771 square foot accessory dwelling unit on the first floor into an 881 square foot two bedroom ADU that complies with building code requirements and has an eight foot ceiling height. Building code only requires seven feet, but they're proposing eight feet. Constructing an access stairway and a new entrance to the ADU at the rear of the building via a shared stairway and landing that will also provide rear access and slightly expand the deck off the upper stair upstairs unit. The project requires the approval of a conditional use permit, a design review permit, a variance to the minimum and combined side yard setback, and also requires that you grant an exception to the floor area ratio limitation um, with the conditional use permit, which is how it is it's it's listed as that's how you grant exceptions for ADUs. So um, we did a lot of research on what exists in the existing neighborhood, and there are there are quite a few du. This is our this is the Fairfax duplex zone. It's called the RD 5.5-7 zone. It allows single family homes on lots of 5,500 square feet and duplexes on lots of 7,000 square feet. Um, those minimum sizes were put into effect in the 70s in a neighborhood where there are very few parcels that comply with those regulations. So this site um, is small. Um, hang on a second, I'm losing my place here. Well, you do that. The history was fascinating on this, Linda. Uh, it is fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, that Fairfax has put in place regulations that have rendered most of their residential properties non-conforming. <laughs> so anyway, um, so the project is not out of character with the development that you find in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, they are complying with FEMA regulations. It will bring their insurance costs down, but what the building official explained to me is that we are required to, when someone does any kind of improvements to a property in a floodway, we're required to have them raise their floors above the flood elevation in order to uh, maintain our good standing with FEMA and in order for all the, all the houses in the floods, flood area to get 10% um, off of their flood insurance, right? It's Excuse me, can you repeat that? Yeah. We're so right now we um, we have a standing with FEMA because we have passed they, they come in periodically and they check through all our building permits to make sure that when someone does substantial work on their properties and they're in a floodway or a flood zone, we require them to get their floors above the flood elevation. If we if they come in and we don't you know we don't require that and we allow people to do work on their homes, we we jeopardize everyone that has to get flood insurance, um, we, we jeopardize they're getting a 10% break because the town complies with this program, right? So everyone in these neighborhoods, eventually they're gonna have to work on their foundations or they're gonna have to you know, replace wiring and they're going to be in the same position 
these people are doing it voluntarily. You know, I don't know that the house is in such bad shape that they actually, it's going to fall is down. There, what is the trigger? Is there a certain amount or they a 25%? Use, no, use, they use the word like the fire department does, substantial remodel. Substantial. Right. So for us, if you're if you're doing a, if you have to put a whole new foundation under the house, you're affecting the square footage of that whole area, right? Sure. One story that's house. How, that's how you count it. Remodel. Yeah. Where would one find a map of those zones? Is it on our website? You actually can get it on you can actually get it on Marin Map. If you go in, any any user can go when you go to applications at the top of Marin Map. You'll see a FEMA flood, and you can see the floodways and the different flood zones for the town of Fairfax. Perfect. Thank you. I digress, but that's important information. Okay. So yeah. So the project's at you know they're raising the house up, and so they're actually proposing to increase the minimum setbacks um, that the house may, that. that the house is going to maintain on the lower floor by three inches on both sides. I see that. So it'll increase um, the setbacks by three inches from three feet, nine inches to four feet. And the combined side yard setback will increase from seven feet, six inches to eight feet. Um, but a variance is required and, and a variance is not required for the portions that they're just lifting up and, and increasing the setback on. The variance is actually only required for the 17 square foot addition and access stairway at the rear northwest corner of the building and for the small one foot deep enlargement of the upper unit rear deck. The original submittal came in and they had designed a front access and a back access mm -hmm. to the APU. And so the, it resulted in two stairways in the front of the house, yeah. which is really out of character. And they you know, we said that's not gonna work and it's not required by the building code. So they voluntarily redesigned the project. So now the front, front will look basically the way it does now it's just going to be five feet taller it's still underneath the height limit Let's see um the the exterior of the building and the window um and the window styles of the existing portion of the upstairs aren't changing they're going to match the bottom to the rest of the house the stucco siding um and the colors they are proposing to, to, to make some modifications to the windows for the lower unit. And the, the changes are as follows. A larger window is proposed in the western wall at the existing lower floor kitchen. The bathroom window on the west wall would be shifted to the north several inches so it will be between the toilet and the bathtub once the bathroom is remodeled. The west wall front lower bedroom window will be enlarged. And on the eastern side, a window in what will be remodeled into a second bedroom will be replaced and enlarged slightly. The second window on the eastern side of the lower floor and the chimney will be removed. All the windows on the sides of the building will be higher in elevation owing to the four foot one inch increase in finished floor elevation over the existing floor level. So all the residences along Napa are close together with the windows facing the respective neighbors. Um, including the ones adjacent to 18 Napa at 16 and 20 Napa. If the commission is concerned that the increase in height and slight relocation and enlargement of the windows on the east and west side will substantially impact the privacy of the neighboring properties, or if any neighbor expresses concern about the window locations, the commission can add a condition into the resolution recommending that the owner and his architect work with the neighbors prior to submitting their building permit to relocate or redesign the windows so that they are acceptable to all parties. I, I go out there and I just see that everybody's windows are facing into each other's properties. And so um, I, I didn't wanna make that a condition until I heard from the neighbors, you know, to see if they're worried about it. Everybody seems to have blinds and drapes. Um, so anyway, that's enough on that. There's currently no exterior lighting proposed for the project, but if changes are to be made to the lighting, a lighting plan that includes dark sky compliant fixtures shall be subject to review by the planning director. We've added that as a condition. So anyway, we, we feel that the, you know, the project is a good one and it's gonna bring the property into compliance. The other thing it's going to do is we're getting a lot of applications for one bedroom and studio ADUs. We're getting very, very few for two bedroom units. Yeah, it's unusual. So this is, um, 
this would be a good addition. I also want to make sure make sure it's very clear that 771 square feet of the lower floor is legally there. It was part of the house. It was developed as living space. So that's not an issue. That's they're already it's already developed as living space right now. So they're just trying to get a, a more moderate sized ADU. And so we're recommending approval of application 2016. Um, and we're recommending that you adopt resolution 2020-13 setting forth the project findings and conditions of approval. And that would conclude my report. Okay, thank you. Great report. This is one of those things where they're taking a uh, really old classic under under you know under under built house and turning it into a more modern structure. Okay, um, questions for staff. Yes, Commissioner Swift. I, I, oh, Swift. All right, Swift then Fergosa. I had a couple questions. Um, in the report, it talks about the, you know, the FEMA aspect of this, and there's a statement in there that says base flood elevation is at 106 feet. Can you tell me what that means? Yeah. So I, um. I'm not the expert on this, but I believe it's the elevation above sea level, right? And so it's the height that the flood, the flood waters get in a 100 year flood, but it's not above the grade below the house. Am yeah, I right, I Ben? Can, they I take could jump in on that. Um, it's based on uh, a national vertical datum. Um, and I believe that the, the current vertical datum used is NAVD. Uh, and, and so it, it, like Linda said, it's a height above sea level, uh, but it, it's it's very carefully benchmarked and it varies okay. according to where you are on a particular stream. So as you go further downstream, your 100 year flood height would be at a lower NAVD. Okay, elevation. got it. Because I, I did look up, I think it's in like category AE or something like that. And I looked up what, what that meant as far as um, you know, your your risk of uh, flooding each year for your insurance. So I got that. So thank you on that. Um, the upstairs rear deck, can you tell me what the existing dimensions of that is and then what the proposed dimension would be? You know, like the depth and width. Yeah, hang on. Hang on. Oh my God, I, I measured this, but now I don't have my measurements. I apologize. I sometimes get two sets of plans going, and I think I measured. I measured this, but I measured it in a different set of plans than I have. That's okay then. Um, no, no, it's okay. It's very. It, it won't take very long. So the existing. I don't know. The architect can probably answer this right off the top of her head. Okay, I'll wait until. Um, yeah. And my last question relates to the ADU aspect of this. Mm -hmm. So this is the first application that we're looking at in the ADU code under 1704810H, which gives us the ability to um, do a CUP. Right, correct. But, um, and what that states is that um, we can approve an ADU that doesn't comply with um, paren A through paren G2 in, in the code. So within paren A to paren G2 are um, a couple of restrictions, items that um, are important. One is um, E3 is the restriction on rental terms of less than 30 days for ADUs and E7 is the requirement for a deed restriction. So I just want to be clear that even though we we're approving this under 1704810H, 
that those elements would still be applicable. They would, and we actually discussed it when you brought that to our attention. And so we will make sure that the deed restriction includes that 30 day rental, you know, that you can't rent for less than 30 days, right? Okay. And the, yeah. Because if, if we do go to, um, to approving this, then that might be something I'd like to, to see yeah. in the road though. Sure, but, that's a great idea. Okay. I'm great um, with questions and I'll wait on the upper deck until we talk to the applicant. Thanks. I don't know why I'm having to find an old set of plans or something. Oh, there it is right there. Did I turn myself on? Okay, that was a great discussion. Any question, any further questions uh, before? Norma, we... I think had a question and then I think, or Mimi, and then I had a question too. Gee, I did have a question, and it was so long ago I forgot it. Uh, I'll, I'll, you can come. I'll come back at some point. Thank you. Okay, I guess we'll get to uh, Commissioner Rodriguez' question. Uh, okay, I'm happy to ask it, and it has to do also with flood. And on page three, of the staff report it says the site is in the FEMA flood way, um, and. I think how I typically interpret floodway is that that is the center portion of the deepest portion of a, <clears throat> of a flood channel. And there's a flood zone, which is the entire area that could be potentially underwater. Um, and I thought there, that no construction is allowed in a floodway. And so I just wanted to better understand, I can see on our page one of our staff report, we can see a stream coming yeah. through town and then it goes way around the 300 foot area <clears throat> of where this notice went. I can and address that, yeah, because we've had a project. There was, you know, 31 Bellinas, they actually did a significant addition to that building and it is in the floodway. And what FEMA required is for whatever changes they were making that were going to affect the floodway waters, they had to take away something to open up the channel somewhere else on the property. So they don't prohibit construction, right? And in this one, because of the location of the buildings up the street, it's complete. It, the two buildings on the properties to the west completely blocked the floodway already was the, was the um, determination of the engineer. And uh, we believe that FEMA is going to accept that because you have buildings right up to this property blocking the house. So, so it's true yeah. that they're in a flood way. So would they're in the flood way. Is that current information or is that old information prior to the current uh, water stream being put underground? And we just Can haven't I, corrected the maps. Can it's, I jump in? It's current. Can I please jump in? Yes, let Mimi jump in. <laughs> I live directly down floodway from the floodway that this property is in. I am at the uh, eastern edge of this, and my house is also in the floodway. And I have gotten, uh, you know, there's only one insurance company that will give you flood insurance, and it's the National Flood Insurance Government Flood Insurance Company. There's a FEMA flood map. Uh, that you can Google, uh, floodmap.floodsimple.com is what I've got up here. I just plugged, you know, my address in, but you can also plug 18 Napa Avenue in and pull it up. And what, what you see is that the floodway <laughs> goes right down Mono Alley, basically, to my beautiful house in the middle of, which is blocking on the eastern side, as, as uh, Linda pointed out, you've got like basically book beat uh, at the end of mono on the one side, but really what happens, I, the way I understand it in the flood, is when the stream jumps over Linda at the town hall and breaks over the banks there, it comes to where it used to be before the Army Corps of Engineers moved it to its current location. It goes back to where it used to want to be. And it used to actually flow uh, 
right down, I guess, mono or around uh, uh, Broadway. Uh, there are, you know, like underground areas apparently in that main street part that, you know, may have been useful during prohibition because they were an old stream bed under the buildings. But if you look at the FEMA flood map, the floodway is where the creek would want to go, but for the Army Corps of Engineers and where it would go in a major flood event. So it's and actually got, old information that could be updated by well, the, uh, doing a LOMAR that, amendment? It's not, it's no. Was updated With current, in, no. in about, when I, right after I moved in, it was updated. Yeah. So been, about 2007, 2008 timeframe. And what FEMA is nine. telling me is that they're gonna keep increasing my flood insurance until I raise my house over the, the flood uh, level. You know, and I was really interested because I was getting deep into this. I'm at like, my flood thing is 103 and this is, I think you said it was 106. And you can see all those numbers on the, the FEMA flood map, uh, you know, where that all is. And we did have an opportunity, I think, back in the late 2000s to, to comment on FEMA's revisions of this map, because I remember feeling like I heard about it right after that time frame had passed or something. Yeah. But anyway. Mimi, can I ask you a on, question? On, the map on Marin maps is, is pretty good. Or Mimi or Cindy, can I ask you a question? I'm looking at page one of our staff report, the map of the project area. And I see the stream, the creek that's below the red circle, right? So are you saying that the floodway basically encompasses the whole red area from town hall up no. and across Mano or is it just the street? No, it's, it's, I think uh, Generally. Michelle, Michelle, Michelle characterized it pretty well. It's where the, the deepest part of the flood would want to be. You've got okay. uh, a flood way and a, maybe a flood plain. A flood zone and a flood, flood plain. Zone. So it really, it goes um, down Bolinas and turns right on Mono and kind of covers a bunch of the Mono Alley and then goes I through see. my house and uh, and on that way. And then there's also another piece of it that goes where the current creek is. And you can so you see that blue line skirting the town yeah. country club yeah. there as well. The creek doesn't go right through your property though, does it? The creek well, itself. Well, it actually, there's a little finger right of it, it that starts right at the bottom of my property. And mm -hmm. when it rains hard, we get a sinkhole. I think maybe there's mm -hmm. some thing going on back there. Okay, I'm sorry for digressing. That was just interesting. But I wanna ask the applicant about the lifting of the, you know, the, it seems amazing to me that the five feet is gonna get the, the FEMA approval because um, of where of being in the floodway. So I'm be interested in whether they've gotten, you know, assurances or anything from from the flood insurer who provides that insurance. The that this is going to get them the applicant will be up next. Any other questions for staff uh, at this point? Yes, oh. based on what Mimi just said. Does the elevation certificate not confirm that this, this elevation gets it out of the flood way? Yes, it does. And the certificate, the certificate that's behind that right. implies that it's not going to modify the, the, the way the water flows now. Right, so it won't block, it won't be a blockage and it will it's improve. A, yes, it's a FEMA approvable design. Yes, thank yes. you. And I did figure out the change in the deck square footage if you'd like to know. It's going from six, six by 11 to eight by 12. 
。哇。Good report, Linda. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so I guess now we want to uh, call the applicant up and uh, and then Mimi will have a chance to ask, is the applicant present? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Laura. Hi. Um, yes, I'm Laura Caroline, the project architect and um, prepared the drawings and applications. For the project. The property owner, um, John Fitzpatrick, is also um, who's the project manager. He's also available for questions and information. Um, so anyway, I, first I wanted to maybe address the questions that came up. And Linda, I had different um, dimensions for the deck. You did? Okay. Well, I just did. Yeah, I just, um, I was able to check my plans. Um, and currently it's four foot six inches deep by seven foot nine. And so when proposing is six foot deep by eight foot nine. And part of the eight foot nine is that's just kind of how the, the, the landing worked. And um, the four foot, I was just trying to make it a little bit more usable um, because um, yeah, I think I was. The deck it. basically has to be rebuilt. It's part of the process of um, lifting the building. So that's why I just took the opportunity to make it a little bit more usable. So, Laura, this is Tamala. And before you go into your um, presentation, I just want to confirm we, I do have a hand up for a phone number. Is this phone number uh, also the applicant? Um, what, um, what number do you, um, oh, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I, 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 415, uh, 488-9221. That, that's probably, yes, the app. Great. I will allow this person to talk. I'm so sorry. Please go forward. Okay. And I think that's I their, their home number, so. And are you guys seeing the screen sharing that I'm doing for Laura? Are you guys seeing the fo the? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry. To okay. But, you know when you want me to change the picture, Laura. Okay. Yes. And um, and I also wanted to bring your attention to the um, the flood engineer's letter that was at the last page of the staff report. And he um kind of he, I think did a really he explained the the shadows and the um, the flood the um, the construction that you you are allowed to do and the building at um, the next door buildings at 20 Napa and eight and 86 mono they're upstream and they create existing obstructions and so for this property at 18 Napa you can't add any new structures that are in the shadow created by the adjacent um, buildings, but we're not because of the shadow, because those other two buildings already create a shadow on this, this um, property. We didn't really have, um, um, and, and our improvements weren't, were already within this shadow and the stairway can be open and allow the flood waters to, to flow underneath. So we met all the requirements of the floodway. And I think someone else had a question about um, the, the finished floor above the base flood elevation. And I think that one of my slide number three, I think I explains how we're making it work. So the blue line is what the flood elevation is, and it's one foot above where the current lower floor is, which is, I showed in yellow. So right now we, we have a concrete slab on grade that's one foot below the base flood elevation. So um, the new um, 
FEMA requires like any new finished floors be at least a minimum of one foot above the base flood elevation. So the new, so you can see the new floor has got kind of a squiggly line. So that's the new floor elevation will be at least one foot above the base flood elevation. And then right now there's only six foot eight ceiling height and they're gonna provide eight foot ceiling height. So the rest of the building's all gonna be lifted up and then there'll be new walls that are placed on the lower floor. So, um, I don't know if, if John's available, would he like to say anything now? Well, can you hear me? This is Don Fitzpatrick, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. We hear you. Well, uh, first of all, okay, well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. You've got your radio on or something in the yeah, background. Yeah, I got, and... got the television on. I'm walking away from it. Is that better? That's good. Does that help at all? Sounds good. We hear you. You don't okay. need to wait for the television feedback. You can just speak at real time. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, so we, um, I've offered this, getting this house above the floodplain is a big deal because every year when, when there's a storm, we're sandbagging and the tenant had left and we thought this would be a perfect time to address this situation and we could lift the building up. Another thing we're doing is we're eliminating the gas, the wood burning fireplace, which will, which should help the, you know, the, for energy and, or for smog and stuff. And, uh, and just f uh, make everything more uh, livable downstairs. And so that's basically what we're doing or trying to do. Right. Is, is there any kind of sump pump um, utility being uh, installed here? Or? No, okay. no, it, it, it'll be it'll it'll be at an angle to where if any water water won't come in it will go right out again if it did come in but no there's no sump pump in there it's going to be um it's going to be a slab where the garage is and in the back it's it'll be uh you know up three feet from the from the floor the floor will be up three feet from the ground with the cement uh I'm going blank here with the cement foundation going around it. A new cement foundation. Okay, thank you. Other questions for the uh, applicant or architect? I, I do have a question. I'm, I guess I'm particularly concerned about 16 Napa. And when you look at your first slide, if you could go to that one. They're the property on the right of this, which really isn't shown. It's a single story, very low. This, this goes slightly down on your right side. It's a very low pro profile home. You have two bedroom windows, which face that wall that has two existing windows. And what looks like it's proposed is um, uh, widening the windows and adding a utility door there. And so I guess I'm wondering just what your thoughts are about those two interfaces or what they might be seeing or just as you raise the structure even taller, because as you can see, the right side of the structure is slightly taller already than the left side of the structure, and then you're going to be raising it. What, what are your, what's your thinking about that interface? My thinking? It's really um, for well, your architect. For well, first of all, we were going to try to take the door, the utility door, and move that into the garage, so that wouldn't be there. But the the sun, the way the sun works, it comes up on. We we don't block their sun, so they, it all comes in from the other direction. And and right now, our houses are really close together, you know, and and it is pretty tall wall right in in front of them already. So I don't think they'll notice much difference because I, I think they, you, you kind of look out on your son side not not on the, the shady side of the house but that's just my opinion and um, I 
about the window size, that particular size um, the we um, are for egress windows. Um, they're five feet wide, which is the is um, I don't think you can get them smaller than five feet wide when you have like the slider type and make it meet the egress on the, um, which I'm looking at my plans on the, um, on the west side, um, the window that's up towards the front, that has to be the egress window because now, because of the way the staircase works, I can't get a window on the front of the, on the front south side. So the one that's shown on the west side, the front, the front corner, that needs to be that size. So I can't really make it any smaller. On the other side, um, I'm, we're proposing, um, it's the same thing. I mean, um, I guess you could on the north side, move it over under the deck but it just seemed to work better on that side. And as John said, and I already discussed with Linda that um, John has requested that the, that the doorway for that mechanical room, we're gonna move it inside the garage. So we are gonna eliminate the one door to the outside that was for, gonna be for the mechanical um, room. But um, that's a change that Linda said we could do during building permits, so. And so just clarifying the five yeah. foot increase on the building, it's two feet to get it to address the flood issue and three additional feet to increase the interior ceiling heights. Right. That's mm -hmm. how that's how we got the that's how we got to those numbers. Yes. All right. Thank you. OK. OK. Any other questions for the applicant or statements the applicant would like? Yeah. To uh, this is Mimi. I have a question. Okay, please go ahead. Um, hey, Laura. Good to uh -huh. hear you. Um, are you guys uh, planning to do uh, fencing in the back on the alley side? Um, I ask because there's a beautiful oak tree back there. And, um, you know, I have a few concerns about... Uh, the wildlife in the alley gets stuck. All those fences are so high and there's no gaps between any of the neighbor's fences. And uh, right now, you know, with the work going on there, the, the fence is just some bamboo and it's very porous. And I've, I've seen the uh, wildlife taking advantage of it. And it occurred to me that um, you know, creating uh, some some relief to wildlife that are getting stuck at back in the alley between downtown Fairfax and the more residential quiet neighborhoods uh, might be uh, desirable for that for that back fence, like to maybe leave the oak in the alley part. I don't know. I'm just uh, throwing an idea out. Well, I'm, I'm a big time wildlife lover to say the least. And, and the oak tree is half in my property and half in 16's property. And, you know, I really like the squirrel. We have a lot of squirrels there and stuff. So it's, uh, I'm open to suggestions on that, but we certainly would not be touching the oak tree. Uh. So John, I think, isn't there already a fence back on that back property line that's along mono lane? Yes, there is a fence. We, yes. Yeah, and so we were. You were not planning to make any changes to what's already there. No, we well, we probably put a newer fence in. It would be, yeah. you know, but yeah, but I'm open for suggestions for wildlife because I'm I'm, uh, you know, I'm really into wildlife. Well, my, you know, right now it's not a necessarily a fence, really, right? Right now it's like that bamboo screening. Stuff. Yeah, it's that's a that's like a used as a. Uh, to let, let a vehicle in if we want, and we can just pull it back and forth easily. That's, it was just put in there temporarily, actually. And it was very convenient for the large raccoon I encountered in the alley uh, the other night to kind of slip away and, and go through that to get 
away from being in the alley. And that was my point. I thought if you guys are gonna replace that line on the alley with a fence, uh, would you consider uh, fencing the oak so it's still in the alley? So a raccoon who wanted to escape from sure. you know, the, the, the social life that's in that alley most of the time could go up the tree, for example. I don't know about deer, they're not gonna go up a tree, but I know a raccoon can. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, that'd be no problem. Okay. Are, we, are we kind of proposing that as a condition, possibly? I mean, yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because the only design element I saw relating to any changes in the back, and I don't know if Laura has a slide with the back and, and what was I didn't, on. I don't have any for the, for the, I didn't show, I don't have any pictures really of the existing conditions except for the front, so. I so feel yeah. the, first, the first drawing in our uh, attachments was uh, the best thing I could see of where the trees were, for example. Okay, yeah, I do have, I think, number four, slide number four, make sure the existing conditions. Um, and so you can see. No, I guess, no, try, try number seven. <laughs> Yeah, there, oh, there, there you go. Uh, so you can see the large circle on the right on Mono Lane on the uh -huh. lower right. That's that's the oak I'm talking about. So, you know, I know that that's like where you would put an opening to let a car in and out when you replace that, uh, uh -huh. you know, sort of construction fencing with a permanent fence. And uh, everybody's got a high fence in that uh, alley you know, almost everybody. I, I can't think of an exception there. So uh, I just feel like an uninterrupted line of fence down that whole alley is so unfriendly to wildlife that, yeah, I would propose uh, that we ask the um, applicant to, uh, you know, work the fence around the oak to leave the oak in the alley over. Yeah, that's, that's fine. It, I don't know if this is relevant or not, but I, I just wrote an article in the Hearsay News in Bolinas for people to open their yards up a little more for deer because so many people are putting fencings in right now that it's affecting the, how, how they eat. But anyway, so I, I'm all for that wildlife. Okay, thank you. Are there any more uh, other questions or comments for the uh, applicant? Through the chair. Yes, uh, Commissioner Fregoso. <clears throat> thank you. I have a question for the architect, Laura. It's always good to see mm -hmm. you. I notice on, uh, on your first slide, the facade of the property, mm -hmm. the, uh, the windows on the right uh, have the curved top and the window on the left is two or three tall, thin windows. Is that is that right? Am I seeing that correctly? And yet on the plans, on the color scheme uh, that we have, the window on the left has become a single square. OK, so um... is that? The will, window, will, will the windows currently in this photograph remain or yes. are they being swapped out for a square? No, I don't know. We're not planning to make any changes to the windows on the upper floor. John, you correct me if I'm wrong. But well, that's right. Yeah, okay, so because I do. So I it do could like be, those. it wasn't, it may not have been depicted exactly correct. So I apologize for that. And I think this picture may be a little deceiving because the ones on the left side, they're like double hung windows, except that the top portion of them have, have like, you know, um, grids in them or mullions. Right. I think, um, I think John, these windows are old, aren't they? That are on the upper floor. So. Yeah, the one on the left is newer. I, okay. I, it was been replaced before we got there, but it, 
but the rest of them are old, old windows, as I can right. remember. Well, I, so I like intense. what I see there, uh, rather than the one rectangle square box that we saw on the colorized sketch. So right, I'm right. The colorized sketch was 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 there were some things that weren't exactly correct that my sure. um, sure. remote I, grafter did. But the idea is the upper floor is basically going to stay the same and the, the roof parapet and everything. It's just, it's right. going to be lifted up so that, um, so then the, the new lower floor can be up the, the level that it needs to be. And there's going to be, have to be new walls built on the lower portion, but yeah. everything else, it's just going to be put up like yeah. on shoring cribbing blocks and it's just going to yeah. be lifted up so you're kind of lifting and stretching it out yes uh, it's yes. it's cool the way you've you have figured that out all right okay any other any other questions i didn't have any questions because i thought the project was members of the public i have yeah um, I, one other I question have, i no i have a question who's next can okay. you hear me go ahead okay um Hi, Laura. This is Hi. Esther. Hi. I was just wondering um, if, because we are, or you are raising this four feet um, above where it is now, and this is a stucco finish, correct? That from what I've seen. Yes. Have you thought about maybe breaking up the plane um, of stucco at the lower, like the you know lowest part? Um, I don't know if you would do a, a color change or put some kind of trim to break that up a little bit. It didn't it doesn't have to be the four feet, but something to kind of break up the stucco mass. Um. Well, at the front, I guess one other item I didn't we failed to mention is that we're also bringing the garage um, back. A little bit so that we can create the the proper length that we need for in the driveway mm -hmm. so there's going to be like kind of a shadow line there's going to be like a little overhang where the um oh so the front okay. so the so the garage door is going to be set back and as linda said we're also bringing in the, the walls on the other side so okay. there's going to be kind of like an overhang kind of shadow line going kind of, around the building okay Kind of like you see on the sides. So I'm looking at the uh -huh. color rendering. You kind of see a, like it projects a little bit. Yes. So that kind of carries through to the front. Does that happen on the west elevation? Because that's the one I'm concerned with. Yes. Okay. Okay. And yeah, then I think some that that I think that helps. It just kind of breaks it up a little bit. But um, you can ask John also if what his, what his thoughts are on um, um, if he wants to do a different paint color on the lower level or not. Well, and maybe it's not the you know the whole lower level. Um, I'm just looking for some kind of uh, relief, you know, from the stucco plane because you are going it's going up quite a bit. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would hate to make a recommendation right now um, in terms of whether it be color or material change. Um, so I don't know if that's something that can be written into the resolution. That's if, if, uh, if he is agreeable to that. Yeah, well, I, I don't mind if the, in the color change, we thought we'd make it um look as natural as it was before yeah. and it has kind of an old look to it the old stucco look yeah and that's you why know, we went with that color we we're not i'm not locked into anything i'm not a very artistic yeah. i think though i think what laura was pointing out actually helps uh if the, if it, if there is kind of like a lip or a ledge that is wrapping around the front of the garage i think that helps too that was not I don't think that was articulated or, or shown on the drawings. Is that correct? Um, it's, it may have been hard to um, no. depict. I think we tried to show kind of like an overhang line. Um, 
But is that on page A three O, like the dark line above? The yes, garage? the dark line on the elevations is, is to depict that, and then on the sheet like A two point one, I kind of have kind of oh, like this dash. Okay, I see this it. Yeah. Dat, this you know dash dot kind of a line, and that's kind of trying to show where the overhang above is. Okay, okay, that's fine. I see it now. I was looking at the as built condition um, and didn't see that. So I think that actually helps. Okay. It looks like a very slight overhang, right? It's not, it doesn't look like much at all. Correct, correct. And then and, um, I think that was also because of the, you know, tr trying to work with the existing building, the existing floor that we had up above you know, and not having to modify the existing floor structure mm -hmm. that much. Is, mm -hmm. is your garage door going to be the same color as the stucco? Um, we haven't really decided on that yet. I, I don't, I mean, no, I, I don't know. I think, that, I think that would help a little bit. Um, just the, you know, the trim of the door, the garage door opening and maybe the garage door um, being a different color, I think, kind of breaks it up. I'm looking at the color, uh, the color render, where everything looks gets the same color. I think yeah, we, it, that uh, would help. And I would be fine, um, you know, with with um, the planning department making that decision or approving the whatever you guys pick. Okay. Can I piggyback on Esther's comment? I also like the idea of the trim and the garage door a different color, but also on the facade, you'll have the new front facing steps that will break uh, mm -hmm. the monotony of all that stucco because you have to get up yeah. through front facing steps and it'll give you a, a balance on that left side as well. Yeah, I think that's true. I had a question for Laura. Okay. Yes. Um, the upper deck uh -huh. that, um, on the side of the one um, one story home. I'm a little concerned when I looked at that as far as how far up it was going to be and overlooking into that neighbor's yard. And I was wondering um, if you would consider some kind of a screening um, on that deck on that side where the single story house is. Um, John? Do you have any um, objections to that? I guess not, but it, I, I don't know if it's gonna make any difference from the way what you can see from that deck now or whether you're up a couple more feet, what you see is gonna to make too much of a difference. I guess, you know, I hate to see more building going on, but if that's what's needed, then that's fine. So Cindy, I mean, are you talking about like maybe having like something that would be kind of like a like a green or something? A, fe a fence or like six I feet mean, high or something? Yeah, or I mean, a when I looked at it now today, there is like a barbecue there. So people are going right. to be out there right. using it. Um, just whatever you can come up with, um, you know, a lattice or something that just kind of blocks that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, for the next door neighbors. Yeah, that's that's just on that one do. side. That would help a little bit. Are you talking about that the deck that's in the um, proposed west elevation, that rear little little deck above the, all the stairs? Mm-hmm. Is that what you're uh, talking about? Yes. Is that the west or the east? Um, no, I think she's talking about the one that's on the, um, would be the east, the Eastern. east side. Right, next to 16, I believe, Napa. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I see. Thank yeah. You. Right. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Any other any other questions for the applicant? Yeah, I have another question for the applicant. Um, hey, go ahead. I know that uh, the foot above the flood level, you're lifting the, the bottom floor, a foot above the flood level. And um, that's part of what the, the town has uh, you know, told FEMA that we're going to do when there's a significant you know, remodel or something like that. And um, I'm just wondering if you have checked with your flood insurer about your premium and made sure that you're going to get um, the, the reductions that I'm getting notices about because I'm in the same uh, predicament as you in terms of where the, uh, in the flood way. Um, that they're going to keep raising my rates every year until I basically do what you guys are doing. But I just want to make sure that that one foot above the, the flood level, which it says is 106 where you are, 103 where I am, um, is going to get you that, uh, that premium discount that, um, because I would hate to have us approve this and you not get it. So I'm just wondering if you checked with the insurance company. I, I didn't check with the insurance company, but I, I'm pretty sure that the bottom floor, I think, is going to be three feet above the flood level. I think. Yes, what, it's, it ends up being about two foot eight inches. And um, because this, also, John, doesn't, because we also wanted a crawl space. To, yeah. for the mechanical ducts and do the like the, the the mechanical ducts also need to be above the flood level also don't they I don't know about the mechanical ducts but the equipment has to be right so so it looks like we've got like a cushion I guess you would say um, can you go has, back to that slide of, I think it was your third slide that right had, uh, and I don't know I mean I thought thought the blue, okay, so you're saying the blue line is the base flood elevation. Correct, uh-huh. And can you put your cursor on the squiggly line that you're saying you're gonna, that that line? Yeah, okay. that's, that's the floor structure. And that difference between that blue line and that line is three feet, it's, two feet, eight inches? Two feet, eight inches, and yeah. Because our we're proposing a floor level of 108.7 and the flood the base flood elevation is 106. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion though, is uh, run these plans by your insurer and see if that'll, you know, if that'll if that'll take care of it. But I don't know if that's a big um, is that a big uh, consideration um, on the part of the owner here? Is is the no. insurance reduction? No, that was not the. That was, I mean, it's nice, but it, that's definitely not the reason I'm doing this. Okay, thank you. Any any further questions for the applicant before we close this part of the meeting? Public feedback. Uh, yeah, we're getting there. Okay, so hearing none, uh, we'll close the applicant's uh, presentation and go to uh, public comment section. This is for 18 Napa Avenue. Public comments, please. Is there anybody raising their hand? Uh, I do not see any hands raised at this time. Okay. Well, seeing no hands raised, um, are there any uh, emails or other contact uh, with staff? Requests for? I received no emails ahead of time and we told people we weren't gonna accept them after the start of the meeting, but let me go in and just make sure I haven't gotten any. 
somebody didn't read our instructions carefully enough. <laughs> I'd sure like to speak to 16 Napa. No, there's no emails. And you know, the notice go, the notices go to both the property owners and the tenants. So both the property owner and the tenant at 16 Napa received a mailed notice. Okay, perfect. All right, then we will, we have opened the public hearing uh, section and hearing none. Uh, we will now close the public hearing and uh, bring it back to the uh, Planning Commission for comments and uh, direction. Commissioners. Well, I would like to propose if we're gonna approve this, which I would be in support of adding a um, <clears throat> paragraph 22 to um, require some portion or all of the uh, oak on the northeast corner of the property um, be excluded from uh, fencing of the yard on the mono at the mono uh, alley uh, piece of the property. Where would that condition go? 22? Yeah, I would just throw it under miscellaneous. Okay. Um, apparently, the, in the discussion with the owner, there's no, no problem with that. So, okay, any, any other comments? Or anybody want to propose a motion? I, I would just like to say I, I really like this when, um, when we're taking a, uh, an existing home and fixing it up and remodeling it to an extent that it, it's, it's safer, better living, um, and it'll improve the neighborhood and of course the, the, the residents. So I'm, I'm really kind of all for the project. I think it's a, a great design and a good way to go. Whether or not it gets the insurance uh, apparently isn't, isn't a big deal with the owner. So um, the insurance break, I mean. So, uh, you know. I'd make another, uh, I'd make another Modification to paragraph seven to add Mono Alley to the list of uh, public roadways that should be protected. You know, that alley was recently repaved. So I'd like to include it in there. Do I, okay, uh, Commissioner Swift? Um, and, and if we're talking about the rezo, I'd like to go back and um, add the two conditions related to the rental and the deed restriction. So, and I know Linda, you talked about it being incorporated in one, um, but I was looking at page five, a number 12. Unless that was the one Mimi already threw in. Um, that said, the ADU may not be rented for a term less than 30 days. And then perhaps on page three, adding a G that says prior to issuance of the building permit, a deed restriction in conformance with 17048010E7 shall be completed. What was that section again? 17.048.010 paren E paren 7. Okay. And that would be page three, um, adding a G. Okay, restriction. Is there any uh, so, issues? So, so we usually require that the deed restriction, that we receive a copy of the recorded deed restriction prior to issuance of the building permit. So you're okay if I say that, right? And include- That's fine. Okay, great. Well, the ordinance says prior to issuance of a building permit, right. Can we make, can we make the second F a G and this one H? Oh, thank you, yes. We definitely can do that. Okay. <laughs> Th through the chair. 
Can I ask about the yes, not to be rented for less than 30 days? Does that mean that they could rent it for 35 days? I'm thinking. Yes. yes. I'm thinking, is that what we want? Or do we really want it to be a permanent rental and not a temporary occupancy? That I really you you would want that, but that's part of the ADU code legislation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's in the legislation. That's it. It can't be rented for less than thirty-one days. That's stupid. Okay. Well, that's to prevent short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. That doesn't prevent a short-term rental because they can rent it for thirty-three days. Right. <laughs> Every thirty-three days, they could rent it for thirty-three days. That is a short-term rental. Well, if we wanted a, a protection, we would say no short-term rentals. Yes. Right. Well, we, we do need to get into that issue um, in an overall way, I think, also. Um, you know, that's maybe we could even, so the applicant is still here, I think, um, and, and mentioned that um, the lease had expired or something or the, or the tenant had left, and so this is a good opportunity to do this. Um, what can I ask the a uh, applicant then what your, what your leases uh, have been like long-term, short-term, et cetera? Uh, Laura or. Yeah, this is John Fitzpatrick again. And the leases have been uh, typically a year lease. And then we just. You know, mo most times people just stay. It's the year lease is up, and then they just stay. Okay. Typical. And this was. Yeah, thank you. So maybe if someone wanted to make a condition like that, then. Well, the question would be, excuse me, whether we have the authority to do so, and and call and and call for yearly leases, or at least use the word, no short term rentals and i, I don't think know his we... response to is an indicator that this is a duplex this is not a single family home with an adu well no i'm not sure that because they're separate unit they're separate units uh we don't know who's going to live in them uh but, and then the other question is, I remembered from before, the question I had forgotten, ADUs do not count toward our housing allocation, do they? Unless they're somehow deed restricted or, or do they if they're within a certain size or, or rental range? Uh, ben or Linda, do you have an answer to that? I'm sorry, it's a little off topic, but not so much. Yeah, ADUs actually, there is some flexibility. Um, it's a little bit complicated to figure out what your, what your income range is. Uh, you know, you have to look at things like rentals, average rental prices and stuff like that. But, um, you know, they, they have that potential and I got that confirmed directly from HCD. Oh, fantastic. And this property is already, when you go to Marin Maps, is already identified as two dwelling units. Okay, so so um, so, do we have the authority then to to say something? To say no short-term rentals, right? Well, I don't know about that. Maybe, maybe that doesn't. That's kind of vague, I think. You know, our attorney drafted our our um, urgency ordinance and then our our new ordinance to comply with state law. And the language that they included, which I believe they feel was all they could do, was the 30 day, the you shall not rent for less than 30 days. So, I mean, I, I, okay. I, if I, believe that was... our attorneys, if I believe our attorneys would have put more stronger language if they thought they could get away with it. But I think. Well, and as a reminder, that ADU code came to us before it went to the town council. So we had that in there. Um, okay, I, I think I, I wouldn't be comfortable with, with changing that for this. It's um, this owner is certainly looking at 
you know, renting this as, as a normal rental and not using it for um, vacation rentals. Um, so I agree with you, Cindy. Right. I agree with you. Given that it was a, a state, it was state language, we need to go with that, but we might want to look into that in the future. I don't know. Anyway, I, I agree with you. Right. So we have to stick within the legal parameters, you know. Exactly. So um, is anybody ready to make a motion? I, I, I've expressed, do we have a consensus? I haven't heard anybody say they just don't like this project. So I, I think we're kind of in consensus on this, are we not? Uh, I'll take a shot at a motion. Um, I move that we approve uh, the use permit variance and design review permit application 20-16 with the resolution I'm looking for it. Resolution number, here we go. It's on an opposite page, 20-13 with all the suggested, how can I put this? All the suggested edits to the resolution and, and uh, but I'm afraid I can't summarize them. Can I try? Please. Uh, paragraph um, 2F uh, on page 3, the second paragraph 2F to be renumbered 2G, and a new 2H paragraph to be added uh, regarding uh, the language that Cindy used relating to 17048. 010E7. Um, the paragraph seven on page four being amended to include the mono, mono alley among the roads to be protected. Um, <clears throat> uh, the um, requirement that the ADU not be rented for less than 30 days being added to uh, page five as the number 12. Page five is the number 12, renumbering everything and adding a second paragraph uh, under the miscellaneous to be the last of these uh, paragraphs relating to uh, keeping the oak tree, some portion or all of the oak tree out of the backyard fenced area. That is the motion. Thank you. So are those amendments acceptable? Yes. Uh, to my motion, I accept those. And duly noted. Okay. Any Anything else? Uh, any other friendly amendments, I suppose, I could ask? Why not? Okay. Didn't, uh, sorry to interrupt, but didn't, some, didn't you want to add screening on the upper deck? Did you get that in there? I would, I, I would not accept that amendment. At the wheel? I would not accept that amendment to the motion, no. Okay. 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 So um, do we have a, is the motion final now? We have that is the entirety of the motion okay. as Mimi outlined the uh, changes to the reso. Did you say no on the deck? I'm sorry. I said no on the screening of the death. Okay, anybody ready to um, second? I second the motion. Thank you. All right, um, then I guess we'll take a roll call vote. Clark? Oh, she's not here. I forgot. Fergoso? Yes. Gonzalez Carber? Aye. Newton? Aye. Swift? Aye. Rodriguez? No, because of 16 Napa. Mm. Okay, and Chair Green? Aye. Motion passes. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, maybe, maybe we could just recommend 
to the mm-hmm. owner, even though it's not in a motion. We don't want to screw up the whole motion, but I think the owner might be very amenable to speaking to his neighbor at 16 and working out issues they might have. Well, I don't know if, the, if they've even heard from the neighbor at 16, but if they do, then we may hear from them also. And there could be an appeal, which is 10 days uh, period from now and a uh, $500 uh, fee to the town council. Okay, I might say that since we rearranged the uh, agenda tonight, we're done with the project part of the meeting and we're going to be getting on to the um, the map is the next thing, the map situation. And the, the ridgeline corridors. Ordinance, so um, report please. Thank you, staff. On the amendments to town code title 17 zoning chapter 17.060, which is the consideration and recommendation of an ordinance amending adopting ridgeline development, title 17. Thank you, uh, Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Yes, this is a, a review of the addition of maps um, that will further clarify the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor boundaries um, and also clarify uh, how those maps are to be applied. Uh, it will add exhibits to our town code, recommends adding exhibits to our town code showing those uh, new maps. Um, and the cumulative map combining all of the variously uh, subdefined ridgeline scenic corridors. Let's note this is the eighth planning commission meeting on this topic. Um, and that at the last planning commission meeting on November 19th, the commission uh, affirmed that major ridges uh, as referenced in the code are the 13 ridges that are presently shown with Ridgeline Scenic Corridor in the 1974 Visual Resources Map number nine slash general plan visual resources map. That Ridgeline Scenic Corridor boundary should terminate at the bottom of a ridge where the ridge meets the flat Pena Plain as we call it. Um, that areas within each of the various Ridgeline Scenic Corridor descriptions should be combined in a final cumulative Ridgeline Scenic Corridor map. Um, and that there are some proposed amendments to uh, sev section 17060020 to clarify the RSC boundaries. And looking at those boundaries, <clears throat> uh, the first is that there's five sub uh, definitions of those boundaries uh, to basically, again, clarify where that 100 foot vertical drop from the ridgeline ridge line scenic corridor would uh, run and terminate uh, those clarifications. Let me get a sip here. Uh, excuse me. Uh, again, that the RSC would terminate the bottom of the ridge, um, that the uh, 100 foot vertical drop RSC would be measured perpendicular to the ridge line. Uh, that the outer boundary should be set where an appreciable uphill slope is encountered and uh, the consultant, the GIS consultant and staff looked briefly at the what appreciable is. It's not a firm term, but basically where you have about 10 or 15 feet of uphill slope, um, you would go to the middle of the swell, I'll get more into that in a second. Um, and that again, the 1974 visual resources map number nine uh, should be and in, in fact was used as a rough reference for the town's intended RSC areas. Um, and that finally, we have two ridges, uh, the Fairfax Ridge and the Bald Hill Ridge, um, where previously the 100 foot vertical drop boundary really expanded the width of the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor at the very bottom of the ridge where it was basically the least applicable and that therefore we should terminate the 100 vertical foot RSC where the 150 foot horizontal RSC and 100 foot vertical RSC boundaries coincide. And you can see that in your attachments to your uh, staff report. 
And then getting into the language, uh, we realized we had to do a little bit more clarification. And so uh, in coordination with the town attorney, um, we have come up with the language that you see there under the uh, revised zoning language section. I don't think I need to read that um, fully out. It basically just talks about the 150 foot horizontal distance and the uh, 100 foot vertical distance. Um, and that we would reference the, the, the maps and specifically also the uh, cumulative area map. Um, and that Appendix A, and all this would be added to the end of the uh, chapter 17060, that the boundaries of the any designated ridge line on the ridge line scenic corridor, uh, and it provides the details that I just described previously. Um, your commission also requested at the last meeting that there be some real world examples and uh, lo and behold, we had uh, a good example tonight, I think of describing yeah. what's involved in looking at projects, um, you know, this one being directly on top of a ridge, um, which as uh, planner Neil pointed out, uh, you know, it was measured uh, to make sure it adhered to the maximum 15 feet above ridge line height. So, you know, we, we did apply that um, as well as the various other uh, factors that go into reviewing a project located on the ridge line. Uh, the report also describes uh, miscellaneous comments uh, raised by the, or questions raised by the commission at your staff last meeting, which I won't describe unless you have further questions about that. Um, I would know, note that attachment D to the staff report should be used um, as exhibit A2. We were running into a little bit of a challenge uh, locating the electronic versions of the, some of the maps, um, specifically the original ones. So if you look at that attachment D, um, that would be uh, uh, exhibit A2, which is the geo-referenced 1974 map. And then I have, let me just lean back here. Hopefully this will work. Without, oh my goodness, it just goes crazy on the screen. <laughs> Let me just. <laughs> oh, it's like watching a ghost. Um, uh, I could see your elbow. The ghost. Yeah, I know. Isn't that amazing? And your hand Basically, is out there in before. the hillside. Got it. It just has to be so flat to work at all. It's weird the way. You know, you could walk your fingers up the hill. Yeah, it's just. Ah, oh, just killing me. In any event, it's what it is, is it's the non geo reference 1974 uh, visual resources map number nine. Uh, so it, it, it includes the areas outside the town boundaries. It's simply the paper map. And it's a copy of it. Um, and what we're really saying is that, that that would also be included. And we obviously have the full size version of that, the original 1974 map. So that okay. would also be included. So staff's recommendations um, are that your commission direct staff on any final edit edits to code amendments, exhibits, and appendices, and vote on a resolution recommending adoption um, of the ordinance changes to the town council and staff is prepared to answer any questions you may have. Okay, well, it's it's been a long time coming to get to some language for the ordinance. Um, and I think my comment is I think this solves all the problems we're discussing. It, it just does. It just, and I'm going through the attachments one by one, and you can see, you know, and, and applying it to, to the real world uh, we had tonight and all that. It's kind of, uh, I really, I don't have any changes to this. Um, revised ordinance language myself. I think it's pretty good. Um, just about every, it's like the whole sink, uh, you know, the whole kitchen sink in there almost. That's my comment on it. I appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Swift. I've got, um, Ben, I've got four questions and I'll have comments later after public comment. Um, so my first question is, you mentioned the outer ridgeline scenic corridor 
boundary shall be located at the midpoint of the swale before an appreciable uphill slope begins. Can you tell me what that means? Yes. What it means is as we are dropping down the ridge line, dropping down the slope from the ridge line, the problem we encountered, and this was really noticeable on Fairfax Ridge at the bottom, is instead of it being a clean ridge that's high above and it, the, the slope drops away, you get what, you, what is really more of a rolling hillside. And so you've got sub ridges or finger ridges, however you want to describe it. And then you have the little gullies in between and another term for that is a swale. And so the idea is that as we noted in several prior meetings, if you're trying to just follow the 100 vertical foot drop uh, as it was originally written, you would never get to the bottom because you're just going along the same level on the hillside. I um, mean, you're going up and you're going down and you're going up and, and without the corrections in this one in particular, uh, I think we ended up with a 1500 foot wide ridgeline scenic corridor on the bottom of Fairfax Ridge. Okay. Uh, and, and we could have um, got further. My second question is, why is a portion of the Glen Drive Ridge on the staff report Attachment B, not identified as part of the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor. Um, probably, let me, let me look. Off the top of my head, uh, because it's, it's where it drops down, uh, there's actually... I mean, it's also outside on that map. It looks okay. like it's outside the town's boundaries. Okay, you're talking about Glen Drive now? What name? Glen? Glen Drive. Glen Drive Ridge on a tap. Right. So where are you saying it's not included? I'm, I'm just not clear on that. It's in the upper left side of the map, attachment B. Okay. Uh, let me see. So are we talking about the cumulative map or the close up? I'm talking about attachment B to the staff report. Okay. Fairfax yes. Bridges, oh, right. horizontal yes. distance. Yeah. So that's that's an area where it's not in the town. We, you know, one of the challenges, of course, is that our uh, GIS consultant, Jill Templeton, is, is very good and not cheap. And so if we were to start uh, trying to define areas which we don't really have jurisdiction over uh, within this RSC effort, we would be spending a lot of money. Okay, um, and, and I'll with... comment on that later um, because that concerns me. But let me ask you another question. So you sent out an email on the 15th with maps that were intended to accompany the town council resolution. Right. And I think there were four of those. So my question is, I didn't see those posted to the online packet for the public to review. Um, so how would the public have had a chance to review those as a part of this planning commission agenda so that they could comment on them tonight? Or um, what was your intent with that? Right. The the maps are actually encapsulated as attachments. They're described under a different term. Um, they're attachments so to, to the staff report. They're just described as, a, as a, on a different name. Um, what we did was use the slightly different title, I believe. Uh, yeah, and, I, I took those four maps and I couldn't match them to anything that was on the staff report. So that was my question, because okay. the titles were all different. Okay. Um, and my, my last question on this is, do any of the visually significant areas on map nine, would any of the those fall under the Ridgeline development code? Would those, would that Ridgeline development code be applicable to any of the visually significant areas on map nine? Right. Uh, the, the current Ridgeline Scenic 
uh, root zone development code does not specifically reference uh, visually significant areas. Right, it doesn't um, reference them, but I was just wondering if any of those areas fall under um, what would fall under the Ridgeline Development Code by where they were or their height or any of that. Yeah, it, that's good. That's an interesting question. Uh, it, I, I can't answer it for a certainty right now. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the 100 vertical foot um, RSC um, would in, would capture some of that in okay. general. If you if you look at the original 1974 map, you can see that the two areas kind of lie side by side. For example, the bottom of Jolly Hill is a ridgeline, a visually significant area, but the ridgeline scenic corridor, you know, stops, and then the visually significant area starts. So, uh, okay. I'd, I'd have to do a little bit more research to find out if there's some overlap at this point. All right, those are my questions. Thanks. Okay, very good. Thank you. Those, those, you know, always we have pretty good questions on our panel. It's great. And a year of good questions. Um, any, anybody else next? Yeah, I, I must admit that I uh, did Go not see. Oh, it. can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I didn't. I didn't see the uh, subsequent email with the subsequent maps, so I was very confused. Um, and I'm on the website now and looking in the packet, and I, I see maps in there that I didn't see, but I'm still confused about, uh, you know, the nature of the attachments to the recommended revisions to the ordinance. Um, just in terms of the descriptions that you've got here, uh, and I just want to clarify that I understand um, A1 is visual resources map number nine, the one that uh, you were trying to hold up. Uh, Exhibit A2 is a geo-referenced visual resources map, and uh, that's more along the lines of attachment B that we were just looking right. at, right? You've got the more uh, geo-referenced stuff in there, and it's, and it's the whole uh, town area included in that uh, A2 attachment to the proposed code revisions, right? And then- uh, Not just the town, but the enti entirety of the area that was included in the original map. The town area is highlighted, but that addresses the commission's concern that we were leaving out some of the extra jurisdictional areas. So those two maps include the entirety of what was originally mapped in 74. Okay, and then the A3 and A4 are likewise, uh, showing the the shaded areas in uh, our maps, depending upon whether it's the 150 feet horizontal distance map or the 100 feet vertical distance map. And then B just puts all those layers in one map. Is that right? Yes. And you know what? I, I realized when I spoke, I, I believe I misspoke to uh, Commissioner Swift because I think what what it what you see are details uh, showing those 150 foot and 100 vertical foot 150 foot horizontal 100 vertical foot maps and then shows all of that combined in a cumulative map but did not walk through each of those two maps so there's the 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 materials that you got sent are just calling out the 150 foot horizontal separately and the 100 foot vertical separately but those are referenced in the cumulative map, which was included in the original pack. And then I would, the, the cumulative map that you got resent um, because this is intended to be a official document of the town. What we did was we, we uh, included the parcels um, and the idea being, uh, and I had a conversation with the town attorney um, even though this is a digital product and will be most functional used as such 
and the expectation is everybody's going to jump over to Marine Map, and we will uh, put a link to that digital product on our town website to facilitate that. We also need to be able to control um, the, the exhibits that we incorporate into our code. And for that reason, we need to have something that is available at town hall that is the official version of the map. And so what the intention is, is that uh, once we get your commission's <clears throat> blessing on this, um, and particularly the, the cumulative map, we will take the digital file over to a print shop and get a, a 20 by 30 map printed up, uh, which will provide enough detail so that if somebody doesn't want to uh, go online or isn't able to go online and wants to have a pretty good idea where their boundary, uh, where the boundaries of the RSC are relative to a particular property, they could do so at town hall. So that will satisfy the legal requirement that we have an official document here at Town Hall that is the cumulative Ridgeline Scenic Corridor, um, while at the same time acknowledging that we live in a digital age and it's a heck of a lot easier and more convenient uh, to go to uh, the GIS program on Marine Map and, you know, zoom in and add layers and just subtract layers and things like that. Okay, all that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, any any other? Uh, yes, Esther's hands up. Yes, I um, I actually uh, wanted to say these are these are great. Uh, I'm looking at these attachments. I think they're they're very helpful. Um, I, I kind of have a question that maybe is is not. Um, you know, maybe this is not the time for it, but but just thinking about how parcels will be treated that are are partially in the corridor. So if you, I mean, has anybody thought about that in terms of when these um, restrict or limitations would kick in if you have a parcel that is, you know, a quarter in the ridge line or halfway, would the rules apply to those parcels? entirely well the anticipation is you know the the, the nice uh, thing about tonight's example was it's right on the ridge line and so you know the question was okay how do you apply the 15 foot height limit relative to the ridge top and what you could see from the information provided was uh, that it did not extend above that 15 feet above ridge top um, as you start to get down to parcels uh, that are partially in and partially out you're now, uh, you know, 150 feet horizontally from that ridge line, or 100 feet vertically, which typically is even further down from that ridge line. Uh, the expectation um, is that if there is a portion of the park property that's out of the RSC, then the ridge line uh, restrictions would not apply to development in that area. If it were a combination area, then. Uh, you know, if, if it were partially and partially out, then it we would probably say, yeah, you're subject to it. So it would provide an incentive uh, probably for people who had the option of developing outside the RSC to do so. Um, but, and as I said, because it's a very precise digital product, mm -hmm. um, when they provide a, a, a survey property, they would easily be able to locate where that boundary is and make the adjustment accordingly. Um, we would definitely be looking at the portions of a project or if a project were in the RSC with uh, the RSC regulations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. And this, uh, this whole, uh, scheme that you presented this month seems to be a pretty good culmination of, of all the ideas we've had and solves the big problem of an applicant who needs to know what's going on with their particular property. So it's, it's great. It's all, it's all a lot of work. Um, and we've had a lot of meetings about it. Anybody else uh, have any um, questions for staff before we take this to, I guess, um, 
the applicant's not here, so we'll, we'll take this to a public hearing. I, I actually, I have one more. Okay. Sorry. All right, go ahead. I'm hoping you guys can just explain to me in the proposed code revisions why we're replacing all the definitions with the one definition. Um, and, and it just seems... Um, I would defer to the town attorney for the specifics. Uh, I think that the idea was to, because there are uh, appendices and things of that nature. Um, and that we knew we were gonna have to amend something like the 100 foot vertical. That was always the kind of the main challenge um, that it was just as easy to rewrite that definition um, as proposed. Somebody has a radio or TV on in the background. It's kind of a disturbing, okay. Um, so any any other um, so what did you want to come away with then, um, um, Ben? On this, what what? Well, I'd like public input. Well, we're going to get public input. I was just asking staff what we're what we're supposed to uh, come away with tonight: uh, approval well, of the ordinance or. Uh, yeah, your, your commission has uh, always provided uh, specific comments and questions that you know help illustrate the project and the challenges, you know, the issues or the questions. And so if you had any remaining questions um, about this and if we needed to do a little bit of wordsmithing, I mean, of course, that's always challenging to do it after 11 p.m., but uh, that type of thing. And then finally, just to uh, make a recommendation uh, to the town council, if your commission is uh, comfortable doing so, um, so that we can get this on their agenda and get this implemented into the town code um, and provide that clarity to applicants. Okay, that's that's understood. Now we will bring this to uh, the public hearing and I believe we have some people still in uh, as attendees. So let's hear from them. All right, we do have one call in uh participant who is now allowed to speak uh -oh. Uh -oh. they're listening to two devices they have to turn off one of the devices or we're gonna have to spike it we've become echo friendly yeah okay i think they've solved it now all right good call in user one hey hello this is frank Ager speaking um Am I on? You are it's, on, but it's kind of confusing. Thanks. You say caller using caller call in user one, but your name appears below as another attendee. Oh, oh, the, oh then there's someone else. The, I'll, I'll wait till, I, till I'm called. Oh no, you go ahead, Frank. You're you're you're, you're, you're the speaker. Okay, okay. Um, Director Berto mentioned a, a, a consultant, and so I was wondering who who the consultant is that that Fairfax has hired. Uh, the the jazz specialist is Jill Templeton, who's been working uh, in the county for quite some time, and she's monitoring this meeting. By the way, okay. Bill is a first name. Bill. And last name is. Could you spell Templeton. that? Uh, well, you can see it on the screen. Well, I don't know if you were looking at a screen. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not no. Okay. It's T E M P L E T O N. So Jill Templeton. I can give you her contact information if you're interested. Okay. Okay. Off, off, off meeting. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm looking at that attachment B, for instance, um, and I'm trying to to figure out where where the top of Jolly Hill is, and um, is it between the Marinda Ridge and the Willow Ridge? Let me just but, double check. Okay. It, Yes. The, 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 it, does it show up as either purple, blue, or green in the color codes on the ridge lines? Um, all of the above. 
because th that's one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're combining um, the three. So the, the, the historic, the 150 foot horizontal, which is 300 total feet because it's 150 feet on either side and then the 100 foot vertical. So when you're looking at uh, that area, you, you're seeing all three colors. And I apologize because it's a, it's, it's a very compressed product. Um, and we will provide a full scale drawing in, in, uh, for, for people to review, uh, such as yourself, if you want to take a look at what it is. Um, it will also include, it also includes yeah, well, underlying okay. uh, parcels. Without a mylar, it's really tough to tell what's, you know, what's, what, what's what up there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we, what we can do is get some, I, online it may be possible to zoom in. I, ha, I haven't actually looked at what we have online, but I, I know that that's, that's our intention. So I, I'm hoping that we can get a PDF online that will enable people to really zoom in. And especially if we show the parcels, I think that'll help clarify things. So um, you, earlier I heard uh, a, a, a comparison between the application on Ridgeway, uh, and you really can't compare trying to trying to apply the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor with that application on Ridgeway that you had earlier with with undeveloped. Uh, Ridgeline scenic quarters in, in the town. It, it's um, you know, and and I don't know how you how 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 you 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 define that, but but on Ridgeway you had homes on either side. <laughs> up up uh, at the end of Marinda, there's no homes up there. So um, I, I don't think that's a very good comparison at all. Uh, you know, uh, now is not the time to 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 n modify and weaken. Uh, any restrictive language that we have in our either uh, general plan or open space element or town codes, uh, especially with a pending uh, major application that we have um, for for the the ridge lines above Marinda. So I, that, that's my concern, and, and I don't know if you know I, I've read everything, and I don't know if it strengthens the restrictions or loosens the restrictions. It, it's really hard to tell. So anyway, I, I, I'm taking in your meeting tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Egger. Um, always appreciate your comments and historical perspective. Uh, other attendees? We're still in the public hearing period. I do not see any hands at this time. Okay, it's just a number of, I mean, Liesl is there, Lucy, Alex, none of them, okay. So um, none of them raise their hands, then we will uh, see if there's any uh, email contact or other contact prior to the meeting. Uh, I, I received none. Okay, thank you. Then we will uh, bring it back to the uh, commission and end the public hearing uh, portion and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Oh. Yes, uh, Ms. Newton. Yeah, I, I'm really um, dissatisfied with the proposed revisions to the municipal code because uh, I gather what's being attempted here is to delete our existing definitions of adjacent ridge, major ridges, ridgeline, ridgeline scenic corridors, significant view corridors, and utility lines, and replace them with this reference to a map. And I could be mistaken. If I'm mistaken, I would like to understand how I'm mistaken. Okay, it, and that, that would be a mis mis mistaken is that um, it would simply replace the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor definition. So, yes. All right. Well, then it can't say Section 17060020 is hereby amended in its entirety to read. Okay. 
Okay, if you want to amend one definition, it needs to be written so it's amending one definition. This is, you know, almost in, unintelligible the way it's currently written. Was that it, Mimi? It's just getting me started. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so originally, we started down this road with the idea that we were gonna take this Mylar map and make it GIS. And I thought that we were kind of generally in support of, of doing that. And then, then there were, there's some questions about whether the language in the text of the ordinance was weak and really provided the level of ridge and hillside development protection that the people thought was in there was it reading actually to protect the ridge lines? And then all of a sudden we started to slip into what we have before us, which was we started to talk about that the town is at a particular elevation. And somehow the interpretation was that the maps that we're seeing is showing the physical ridges dropping into the town and that maybe those then shouldn't fall under this zoning designation. But what we have in front of us is, in other words, I have concerns that these maps aren't addressing that, that issue. And uh, uh, as an example, um, we could look at it's difficult even to look at these maps because if you look at attachment A2, contextually, it's difficult to cross-reference then to attachment B. But if you were to try to identify, okay, where is the Elliott Ridge on this map? I don't see it. That's on attachment B. Then you back out to this attachment A2 that we're trying to look at to try to decide if we're eliminating those areas that are flat and drop into the town, but there's no context on this map where I could say, okay, their you know, elevation 200 is the, is the known location of whatever, the center of town. Okay, I can visually see that that is flat town. So I could see where, I don't know, 50 feet, up is areas we don't want to protect. But then when you start to look at this map and you start to see horizontal you know, and vertical topography lines that are being eliminated that are in areas uh, of 280 elevation or 328 elevation because it doesn't fall right onto the ridge I don't consider that, I, I consider that weakening the ordinance. I, and I understand the director's intent was to clarify where was the ridges, where's the drop off, and then how does it, it fall off from there? Um, but I don't, I, 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 I feel like where we started and where we are is not the direction I personally want want to go. And I feel like his point in the report of that we've had eight planning commission meetings on this topic. I agree with that. I don't, I, I feel like there's new language in here I'm concerned with in the ordinance. There's new maps that the public hasn't seen. And I would like to just see us make an action tonight to, to move, to remove, further consideration from the planning commission of any further consideration of this ridgeline scenic corridor because we cannot get clarity. And I just think we're far removed from where we started. And I'm, I'm sorry, but I just can, I'm, I've re I read this or staff report three times and I just cannot get my brain around it. I'm sorry. Well, if, if I might respond, um, I think a lot of this is a question of scale um, and uh, Tamla, if you can, uh, actually, I can share a screen right now. So let me just do something here. Okay, is everybody seeing what I'm, what I've drawn? 
I, what I've got up on share screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is really the crux of what we're doing. Right. Is, and this shows parcels and roads. Um, if we wanted to, we could slap on contour lines, uh, which might help address your concerns, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. I think the challenge is, is that really quickly you, you add a whole bunch of information and, and you get a product that you can't read anymore. And that's why when we did our staff report, what we did was, uh, you know, here's a, here's Marinda Ridge. And you can, you can just tell by the shapes that that ridge line as originally shown in the 1974 map. And as we applied the 100 foot vertical and 150 foot horizontal uh, as defined in the current code, um, ended up with something that we didn't have to clip. It was one of the ridge lines that terminated originally far enough up the ridge. So we were able to apply the 100 foot vertical drop and drop it down these finger ridges. And, and so, as I said, yeah, maybe it doesn't show the contours, uh, but the, the idea is it shows parcels and that's probably more important. Um, as I discussed earlier, the intention is for it to be a graphical product or digital product so that somebody who wants to confirm where that is can simply click on the layer um, and, and you get the contours. And you know, I can pull up a contour if it would be helpful and, and just kind of walk through once again uh, where the end of it is and how we had to clip it. Uh, but I, I'm simply saying that unless we end up with a map like this or a series of maps like this, we are not going to be able to answer the question, whether it's for this development or anybody else, where to apply the, the 150 foot horizontal boundary or the uh, 100 foot vertical boundary. Um, now we could, so we're kind of, we would kind of be in the worst of all worlds. We'd have text with no map. Um, and so if we tried to apply it to somebody um, where we hadn't ever applied it before, uh, somebody could say, well, wait a minute, I'm, you know, you're, you're treating me differently. Well, you can't legally do that. So I, I don't know really if there's an easy answer. We've been struggling to get this uh, uh, adopted. Um, if your commission's direction is you're not ready to adopt this, uh, I, I mean, as you will find out on the next item, we've got uh, at least a year, well, two years worth of work to do um, on, on a housing element. So we can just kind of drop it and, and or put it further down on the priority list and, you know, double take the hindmost. We'll just use some version of the 1974 map. But the attempt here is to simply say, this is what our code says. We're supposed to apply it. The language is there. It says you've got a ridgeline scenic corridor. It's the more cumulative or the more restrictive of uh, visual resources map number nine, the 150 foot horizontal map or the 100 foot vertical map. So if you're saying that we simply don't have the ability to map it, I disagree. I mean, this is what we're doing. We've had to make certain assumptions. I tried to spell those out, but we've got a map here that does that um, and, and does it in a coherent way. Um, and uh, I would be more than happy to continue to work with the commissioners. Um, but I would also like to get this up to the town council because ultimately they're the ones who are going to have to say yes, no, or change this and we'll adopt it. And that's really what I'm looking for tonight is a way to get to the council and do whatever is necessary to explain what we're trying to do here. And if the decision is that, well, if we can't map it, we shouldn't have that language, then let's get rid of, you know, the 100 foot vertical and the 150 foot horizontal and just use the 1974 map as a, as a digitized document, which we can also do. Um, so, you know, it's up to you, you folks, uh, you commissioners, uh, you tell me what you want. Now, I just ask, um, Commissioner Swift will go on just, just one moment. I just wanna make a comment here, is I wonder if it might be a good idea to have a joint meeting with the town council over this issue, since we can't, we cannot, apparently come to, I mean, I think it's great. I think we've, we've, we've accomplished a lot here. I agree with you and 
Um, but you know, if, so, if we can't all get our heads around it, um, that might be a possible solution is, is uh, sometime next year is have a joint meeting with the town council to go over these issues and over coffee or pizza or something. I figured it out. Virtually, of course. Yeah, we could, I, I could suggest that to the town manager. Um, okay, Commissioner Swift. Okay, so we all know this is a complicated topic, so forgive me because I'm gonna read through my comments that I um, have. So, I'm assuming that the revised code language that was in the staff report um, was to section 17060020 of the definitions. And I assumed that, I mean, it didn't say, so I, um, what definition it was changing in there. So, um, you know, I was in agreement with, with Mimi on her comments on that. Um, I assumed it was changing the Ridgeline Scenic Quarters, but it didn't say that. But I also, um, when I look at the definition of adjacent ridge in there, I'm not sure that the definition of Ridgeline Scenic Corridor doesn't um, conflict with what is in the adjacent ridge definition. So, you know, we're looking at, again, one piece of the code and not the whole code from my perspective. Um, the maps referenced in the draft zoning language change didn't correspond with the map titles that were sent out on the 15th, which the public may not have had a chance to review. Um, Defining and mapping only within the boundaries of the town of Fairfax and not the Fairfax planning area is in my view inconsistent with our general plans open space 3.2.2 which discourages development of any man-made structure on the ridge lines and within the ridge zones of the Fairfax planning area and I brought up the question when I looked at a portion of Glen Drive that's outside um, the town's boundaries and so wasn't addressed in this map and I don't know if um, how that is impacted when we're only looking at within the town's boundaries and what we are missing there um, from for protections. And while this, you know, while the staff report stated that the town is focusing on on work within the town limits and not the Fa Fairfax planning area, and that you're focusing on prioritizing GIS work at locations where the town has jurisdictional projects, um, not addressing the Fairfax planning area and all those ridges. Um, and my questions with the visualize, visually um, resources, significant areas, we don't know how that's impacted. Um, you know, what I found is when we touch one piece of something, we never go back and have the time to address all of that. So it concerns me that we will have walked away from the Fairfax planning area and, and how we look at that. I'm also um, concerned about, you know, how we define on that, you know, the 100 foot vertical. So, you know, for those reasons, I'm not in, um, I couldn't approve moving forward with any of this to the town council. Um, and, and I've also, you know, with, with the Ridge, um, Ridgeway application, we were able to look at that from a GIS perspective, just on an application basis for one application. So we know that that is, 
is possible. Um, I'm just not comfortable with where we are right now, and I wouldn't um, move to move anything to the town council. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, just I, since Mimi pointed out, I wasn't actually referring to the uh, ordinance that was proposed when I said I'm in favor of the language changes. I was talking about that section of, just to be clear here, that section of the um, report of the staff report on page two that says revised zoning ordinance language. And that's the part that I was talking about that I liked. Um, so Mimi did point out then that this entirety language is, is gonzo in this situation. So, you know, all we have, I mean, to my mind, all we need to do then it is suggest, because that's the resolution that would be signed by the town council. All we need to do then is is not say, you know, it's this section that's amended instead of saying in its entirety. And I think then, you know, it's, it's good to go. Well, I've got some My thoughts position. about that, Phil, really. Okay, we differ. Well, so, no, I mean, you know, if you look at our, uh, our ordinance, I mean, first off, Ben, I really object to the idea that we don't have a map. What you're saying is our ridge line ordinance doesn't have a map. It refers to something that doesn't exist. And I object to that. Our map exists. It was in an older version of the general plan, but just because we adopted a newer version of the general plan doesn't mean our map disappeared. You know, we even incorporated that map into the new general plan. We just unfortunately gave it a different name. But that map still exists. It's still there. As far as I'm concerned, the adoption of the general plan in 2016 or whenever we adopted it didn't change the fact that our ordinance refers to a map and that's valid. So again, I object to the suggestion that our existing ordinance somehow is lacking in something all okay. right and I, i'm sorry and i want to finish here so okay. this Excuse thing me. phil is if you look at 170060030, which is not proposed to be changed we've got a reference right there to the visual resources map number nine so i totally agree with cindy we cannot take this piece by piece. We have to look holistically at the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor. We can't just fix a whack-a-mole approach to fixing one definition of Ridgeline Scenic Corridor and ignore the rest of this ordinance and not look at it holistically. Okay, I, if I could clarify, um, it wasn't my intention to imply that we don't have a map. What I was referring specifically to is we do not have a map of what we have defined in the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor's definition. We do not have a map that shows the 150 foot horizontal boundary. We do not have a map specifically and especially of the 100 vertical foot boundary. Those are defined as a line within our Ridgeline Scenic Corridor. And yet we do not know where those boundaries lie. Those are the two maps that are missing. I acknowledge that the visual resources map number nine is incorporated by another name as the visual resources map in the current general plan, and that we have in fact digitized and geo-referenced that. So if if that was what I was, it, it seemed to be, I seem to be applying, I apologize. Okay, Phil, I so it'd be kind of good to hear from people about whether we've given him enough direction and continue this item or do we want to move to remove the item from future planning commission agendas can i say something um sure yes. i mean this is this is very complicated um a lot of work has gone into this uh and i'm trying to figure out really and now i'm confused as to what our objective truly is here in in practical terms um, as a design professional, when we start a project to develop something, the first place we go to uh, is the GIS map. And we overlay 
all the all the different uh, parameters and you know for landslide for uh, liquefaction just everything that you could possibly find so that we know what the limits and the criteria are for development in those areas and so when I look at these um, exhibits I get very excited because I actually have a tool that is real that I can apply and guide and advise my clients so that they don't spend $20,000 in professional fees to then come back later and say, oh, by the way, you can't develop here. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this as a, a you know, real world example. And this is um, infinitely valuable for somebody like me and clients. So I don't want to throw in the towel. I don't want to miss the forest for the trees because the language I understand is not there yet. But I would hate to put this on hold for another year, especially in our town. We talk about how special we are, our topography, our roads, our, you know, everything about Fairfax is, um, kind of extreme when it comes to development. And so I, I'm not sure what the answer is. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of frustration. And, um, you know, uh, Ben and I were actually talking about, you know, maybe uh, talking to, a, you know, a college, a university to create a 3D model as a, as a project just to help clients and design professionals understand how to approach development. And then I see this exhibit, um, Ben had been, um, or these attachments, Ben had been telling me about these and, I, and it, it just clicks. For somebody who is used to, you know, working with topography, you look at this and it's all there. So I'm trying to figure out how can we, um, move forward with this without getting bogged down by the details that I understand are very, very important. But I, I just would hate to see this all go bye-bye for another year. Um, well, I think that you're giving some good ideas, but I think you need to articulate where do we go from here then? Because, yes. uh, because we, so, we're not able to overlay different things right. to even know what the differences are. Right. I'm, I'm trying to kind of, what, what I'm saying is, um, I don't think we should throw in the towel on this. I don't think we should put this on hold for another year or two. If we are gonna be very busy with, um, you know, the housing element, I think we need to figure this out. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, if, if we propose a retreat, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, are we talking about a couple of Zoom meetings to try to hammer out the language? To make sure that we're not, um, you know, uh, conflicting with other definitions or parts of the code. So I'm, I'm not, I, I guess I'm two things I'm saying. One is let's not throw in the towel on all this valuable work for our town development. And I guess uh, I'm trying to understand, are we stuck because the definitions or, um, because the codes are conflicting is that I'm, I'm kind of looking to you guys for an answer because I have to be honest I, I don't know where the conflicts are in the code I haven't read through them enough to cross reference and and say oh yeah this definition you know obliterates this part of the code or this other map that we've had so can somebody please explain to me what where are we stuck Well, I mean, I've got a couple of different thoughts on that. Um, you know, I think one of my concerns, which Cindy mentioned as well, was the idea that the maps that are supposed to be attached to the uh, code revisions, you know, I, you all may have access to them, but I still haven't been able to find them. Um, and I would want them to be as part of the, the packet that we're reviewing. Um, 
we've got like 10 or 11 sections of this chapter called Ridgeline Development that are concrete, finite, relatively short uh, sections. I think that they need to, if we're gonna talk about amending the section, as opposed to just the development of a tool that professionals can use, and maybe there's an option here somewhere of creating a tool for the community, for professionals, for Linda, um, versus changing the code, right? Because what we're saying is the 100 foot and the 50 foot, 150 foot um, are meant to capture what we think the code says now and even go beyond based on the geo reference data that uh, Jill has pulled together, which is really great. And I don't, you know, I agree, Esther, that I don't think we should throw in the towel either because I think we should. Uh, keep plugging away at it, even if it takes a little bit more time. And I think we need to take the time to look holistically at these 11 sections and figure out if we're going to create a geo-referenced map to refer to instead of visual resources map number nine in the code that uh, we just make sure we've done it in a way that really does what we intend to do, which I think in short, you know, we'll do a little QAQC here. Um, and, you know, I, I understand the frustration with how long it's taken to get here. Um, <clears throat> I'm frustrated, uh, but, you know, I also think that, you know, there's this other option that, doesn't involve changing the code. And we should talk about that, which is, as Esther said, making it a tool. And I think Ben has thoughts on why he would prefer to make it more, uh, to sort of codify it in the code as opposed to just letting it be a useful tool for the professionals. And, and, but I'm also concerned well, that we're only looking at the town limits and we're not looking at the planning area. So again, I go back to that Glen Drive Ridge that's sitting out of the town boundaries and we're not addressing that. Um, that concerns me. Okay, so, so one thing I might say, Mr. Egger brought up too. Um, we have a project coming up uh, probably next year, I guess, uh, Miranda, Miranda. Um, and, and it's, it's, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, Ben, but I believe that project goes under the current ordinance. If we amend the ordinance, that project still goes under the current ordinance. Is that not true? I think that's true, right? Because they applied based on the current ordinance. Yes. So whatever we do with this amendment, if we do it, it could be passed to next month. Uh, it wouldn't affect the Miranda property. They're still going to go under the current ordinance, right? Well, it's that you, you raise a, an interesting question. I believe that we have the language that discusses the 100 foot vertical and the 150 foot horizontal. We have that language in our current ordinance. So I, I believe it would apply, but the challenge is saying, how does it apply? Show me a map um, that tells me where, where these uh, scenic corridors lie. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the concerns is what I've heard from the commission is that, that there are things do need to be tightened up. Maps need to be uh, appropriately referenced and shown. And I think next time, just for legibility's sake, um, probably a larger scale map so that you can see more of the details and, and you, it just, because I think we lost the, the last meeting we, we showed and discussed in detail where it ran off into the flatlands and we said, okay, this is where we ended it. So we could do a better job of mapping. Um, I think we definitely need to be clear that we're changing the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor's definition simply to, for legibility's sake, and maybe go back to that definition and say, what do we really need to change in that? Um, I, I, some things may have been changed for purpose of legalese and I could uh, work with the town attorney to make sure that it's really necessary to capture uh, the intent of what we currently have in the language. 
Um, in terms of the references to visual resources map number nine, um, that's another valid point is that we may need to look at that and say, okay, we know what that map is, but are we really capturing uh, the cumulative map, um, which is, if you go back to the definition of Ridgeline Scenic Corridor, you know, it's talking about, um, it's talking about the visual resources map number nine, and it's also talking about 100 foot vertical and 150 foot horizontal. So, um, you know, staff is more than happy to continue working on this um, and bring it back to the commission. I know we've had two meetings with commissioners where we were able to go live with the GIS uh, uh, program itself. And that's where this really starts to become usable. And as uh, Commissioner Gonzalez Parber pointed out, you know, that's, that's what professionals do. And I dare say uh, in Marin, as tech savvy as people are, people who are thinking about modifying their homes, they really want those answers. And, and that's the goal here um, is to just say, this is what Fairfax code says. Now, how do we apply it? Um, and so we're, we're happy to continue to uh, work with your commissioners um, and, and if one-on-one -on -one is, is the best approach, um, you know, as I said, we're available to do so. And, and if there's clarifications that we need to do, we're also willing to uh, continue to work on that. Through the chair. Well, I want to, I want to just. Through say, the chair, please. Yeah, I've just, been trying just, to talk for about 20 minutes. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I think there's uh, several things going on here. Uh, one is when we started this, it was not my understanding, even though some people we should think we should do this, but it was not our intent to review and update and rewrite the Ridgeline Ordinance. The intent of this effort was that the map number nine and whatever maps we have that are listed wherever they're listed everywhere were not helpful to someone who was coming in with a development like the project we had today. People couldn't tell from looking at resources map number nine where the hell their property was and where those ridge lines fell and where the 100 feet was and where the 150 feet was. So my understanding was the whole intent is to do basically what we have here, these ridge line scenic maps that show the 100 foot, the 150 foot corridors that allow us to overlay parcel maps that people can understand, oh, I see, my parcel is here at this 188 foot line, or it's here at the 220 or whatever, so they can figure out what entitlements they must secure for a development, or if in fact they want to develop at all. That was my understanding of the intent of this work and the maps I see before us, I think have accomplished that. We can see from these more detailed maps of the 100 and 150 foot corridors where we can overlay uh, a GIS parcel map and people as Esther mentioned can get the information that they need. That is good work. I do not believe that we took on and that we should assume that we're taking on review and updating of the entire Ridgeline Corridor, certainly not at this time, not in this effort. The one question I have is why don't we have the Miranda Ridge here? Why don't we have a page on the Miranda Ridge, which is the project that's coming up, uh, on our heels here that so I would like to see one of these corridor maps in a in a larger scale and and Ben makes a good point everyone has 
the size of these maps is is ridiculously small. The attachment B, uh, I you know, where is B? Yeah, the attachment B. I would need like a gigantic magnifying glass to see it. If we could get maps that are larger scale online or Right now I'm looking at this map that makes a lot more sense than what we have because it has parcels on it, <laughs> but I'm looking at it on my iPhone. So it's uh, the whole thing is two inches by two inches. That's not our fault. Still, no, it's not. I'm saying it's not your fault, but most people are looking at this stuff on an iPhone, on an iPad, on a small computer. That's not the point. The point is, I think the product you're showing, sharing on your screen, is a very excellent tool. This is precisely, I think, the intent of what this project started out to be. I'm not saying we're finished. I'm not saying what's perfect. I think it's a good tool for what planning staff needs in terms of reviewing uh, a development proposal. It may not be perfect, but I think it's moving in the right direction. I'm, I'm not so sure that we should sit on it and work on it for two years until we flesh out every little detail and dot every I and cross every T. I think we have an interesting product now. We've done a bunch of work. I don't know how much more time we can spend on this. We still have to look at the two year general plan housing element scope of work that's before us. I don't see why we can't send this along to council with all our caveats, with all our questions, send it off to them, let them take a look at it, see what they say. They might have feedback, maybe later on we get together, we have a meeting, we talk about it. Why not send this along to council to have them take a look at it? We're not adopting anything. It isn't an ordinance. It work, it's work we've done. Send it along. Let them, let them look at it. Let them chew the fat on this for the next 10 meetings. And, uh, and staff can use it as needed on developments that come up. Work with the GIS. Review those parcels. That's it. It's a tool. I don't think we should take on revamping the entire Ridgeline corridor uh, element at this time. And that's my two cents. Okay. Um, I, I just, you know, so I have a few things I, I don't understand from some of you guys, okay? And I want to I want to understand, for example, Cindy Swift's con really strong concern that we have to detail what is outside of our jurisdiction at all. I mean, because we can't affect those properties. There's, there's nothing we can do about those. That is, it's irrelevant what is outside Fairfax's town limits. Yes, we want a map to show it because we need kind of the con co contiguous geological uh, vision of it. That's for sure, um, the whole area, but we don't have jurisdiction over it. So I don't quite understand why we're so stuck why Cindy is so stuck on including all that in in these maps that are we're never going to have to make a decision about those items. So that's that's well, one. we we don't no, know. I don't, I don't want an answer right now. I'm just right. I'm just going down the line. Right. Uh, I'm totally aligned with Esther. I think she has exactly the problem, and Norma's statement just now it seems to agree with it. Also, is that we we need a tool. This is to me. This is the goal. We we need a tool to have for applicants in Fairfax in our jurisdiction to tell them about so staff can easily point to end to, to what the ridge line issues are to an applicant, and that it would hold up in court eventually. So we need to be fairly well defined. So logically, our town our ordinance has to be amended if we end up with a different map than the one that's mentioned in the old ordinance. If we start using a GIS map, I think we need to, to, to uh, enable it in the ordinance. So I disagree with those who say we don't need to amend the ordinance language. We do, I believe, in order to, to enable the use of those maps 
because it's the ordinance that thought that you know that tells applicants their direction and where they where they can go and then it's maps that those applicants can go to look at to see where their property falls within the direction the ordinance provides that's the way i see it so i just wanted to make and and you know mimi i understand too is there's a history to all this and all no, I don't think anybody is suggesting we get rid of any of the old maps. I, I, I'm, but I, I'm seeing that we're getting really stuck on a few things that to me anyway, like boundaries outside Fairfax town is an irrelevant point. We can't, we don't have jurisdiction over that. So I really wonder why we're stuck on that. So now um, would not mind hearing from Commissioner Swift why you are so strong on this point of including bits and pieces of the county that are around Fairfax that we can't deal with. It had nothing to do with a parcel never going to come to us in those areas. So why are so we... we... We have a responsibility um, and, you, and you can read it throughout the general plan um, to your Fairfax planning area. Um, and when you look at the maps, the original map nine was the Fairfax planning area. You look at the map as it is now, and we're leaving out parts of ridge lines that are right outside our town's boundaries, um, and we're not addressing those. And I don't know that there wouldn't be a a parcel that would be within our town boundaries that would be within the Ridgeline Scenic Corridor of a Ridgeline that's outside of the town's boundaries like the Glen Drive or a couple of these others um, that if we don't map those Ridgeline outside of the town's boundaries, we could be impacting the view of those ridgelines from um, our community. And when you read through the, the ridgeline development, we talk about ridgelines that um, you can view from certain areas in town and things like that. Um, I'm just not comfortable with just throwing away our Fairfax planning area and not addressing it with this. Yeah, I, I see that, but I, I don't we, don't, we would never have jurisdiction over a piece of property outside those boundaries. I agree, though, with you, and I, I do agree with you that we need to include in our maps our, our, our um, contiguous area, um, maybe as depicted by the original old map. So, so fine, I just, I just, we, we can map it, but I don't think we, we have jurisdiction over it. So for us to be kind of, uh, I'll just say it, dicking over this for month after month after month, because we need to include those outlying areas, they, yeah, they should be in the map, but we can't do anything with them. So we, we don't need to, uh, certainly our ordinance, I guess, doesn't need to address anything outside the town boundaries. And, and Ben, you're gonna, China, yeah. please. If, if I might make a, a suggestion, I think the, the, the problem was is that the cumulative map didn't show the entirety of the area and that can be rectified. Uh, the intent, obviously, if it's a cumulative map, it's supposed to show visual resources number nine. Um, so that's a, it, it, it's a valid comment or criticism is to say if, if, if this is the cumulative map, it should show the entirety of the area and we can easily zoom that out and, and reprint it so that it shows the entirety of the area. Um, I think the, the point or the, the, the concern I had was if we were spending a lot of time trying to do the 100 foot vertical and 150 foot horizontal in those areas, we would spend thousands of dollars doing that. But in terms of reflecting what we have, uh, which is the 1974 map, and we've got that digitized and geo-referenced, uh, we can and should include that in the cumulative cumulative map. It won't, it won't impact the accuracy of what we're doing uh, within the town where we do have our jurisdiction. 
Okay, fair enough. I mean, I don't see how we're going to move on tonight, though, Ben. I just don't see. We have so much um, rancor, almost, it seems to me, um, that we don't seem to be able to move on this. And maybe, you know, Commissioner Fergoso is right. Maybe we need to just let, let the town council take a look at where we are and, and let them read our minutes and see what our thinking is and see how we're kind of fractionated here and and uh, and and let them deal with it for a little while. But uh, Commissioner Newton, please. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily uh, think there's rancor here. I, I think um, we may have a disagreement. Uh, and I am not suggesting as part of this, Norma, that we take a complete overhaul of the Ridgeline Ordinance. What I am suggesting by saying that we need to be comprehensive is if we're gonna change one definition, we need to understand what the implications of that term and how it's used and what it means for that definition throughout the chapter. Yeah, you're right. And you're and, right. and you know, so the very next section that isn't being touched refers mm -hmm. to the Ridgeline Scenic Corridors as defined in Visual Resources Map Number Nine. It's a T being crossed. It's an I being dotted. It says we're not going to do a half uh, effort here. And I object to giving the town council something that isn't fully baked. So I uh, don't, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but they're even worse off than we are in terms of the amount of work that they have on their plates. So if this takes one more uh, planning commission meeting, and I see Michelle gritting her teeth, but you know, my one recommendation more. More. is that we ask staff to, uh, if they're going to do this, let's do it in a in a way that is a little bit cleaner than what we saw here tonight. Um, because I feel uh, like I didn't have an opportunity to look at the maps. Uh, I feel that the language in the draft ordinance we were asked to look at was so confusing. I had no idea what was, what was trying to be done. And now that I have a better sense, you know, and if we really want to amend the ordinance as opposed to, and again, I would pose it to you, Norma, and you, Phil, is it, is it really that we want to amend the ordinance or make a tool available to assist those who are seeking to uh, develop in the hills? And, and, you know, those aren't necessarily things we have to do simultaneously. You know, we have this beautiful, all these resources, all this beautiful mapping, it's there now. And, you know, theoretically we can use it as a tool now. Um, so I guess I, I, I don't agree that there's rancor. I just think we, we have to uh, buckle down a little bit before we hand something off to the council. Right, and, and I, you know, Yes, I mean, I see that. So obviously, if we're going to change uh, one section of the ordinance, we have to go through the entire, you know, 17060 and make sure it all um, is consistent. I do think, though, and, you know, maybe legal can help back, you know, figure out if this is true or not, but I think the ordinance enables the use of the map. So or, the ordinance as it exists only talks about visual resources map number nine in several places. And if we, so then an applicant comes in now, sees that ordinance, they want to know what visual resources map number nine looks like, and we try to show them something else, that is not enabled in this ordinance. We can't, we can't really take you know, they you can't say, well, you know, use this tool. I and mean, it's like, you got a, you got a Mac, but you can use PC software. You can't, you really can't do that. I, I think we need to legally change the ordinance in order to enable the use of another tool. But yes, of course, the bottom line is we need the tool. That's it. Whether we change the ordinance or not, isn't as important as the tool we have as a practical matter here in our planning commission, you know, if we want to reconvene the uh, general plan committee, um, then they can take a look at, you know, broader look at all this. But I think we need to concentrate down on 17060, 
you know, go through red line pen, make all the changes we need to make rather than coming up with a new draft. Um, and then, and then we can talk about those changes. So maybe a red line of the current ordinance might be a better idea. Um, then we're not going to say changing it in its entirety to this, you know, we're not. Um, and uh, we, you know, I'm always thinking years ahead, we need to make sure that we have something that holds up in an appeals court. And I don't think if we just change the tool and don't change the ordinance, say we can use that tool, maybe I'm wrong, but I might want to check with legal to see the effect of having using a tool that isn't mentioned or even referred to in the ordinance. I don't think it works. I don't think it's, I would hold up in a court. I can almost hear a judge say, you know, what map did you use to actually grant or deny the permit? And if it wasn't visual resources map number nine, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be an evidence problem, something our former president didn't get. But you're going to have an evidence problem. So, so that's, that's why I'm concerned. I might be wrong. I might be off in left field myself. I could be. So I don't know. Um, I, you know I'm, not a, I'm not a municipal lawyer, so I'm not sure. But I believe that's the case. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, if I might interject, it, it, one of the things I, I said earlier was that every meeting I've gotten useful feedback and this meeting is no exception. Um, I, think, I think the commission has pointed out areas where uh, additional uh, work can be done, clarification, maybe uh, the visual resources map number nine reference uh, in, in, in other uh, sections of that chapter. Uh, need to be looked at. Um, I think, in fact, just, just real quickly, that would be helpful um, just to say, we're going to call that the cumulative map, not just the visual resources map number nine. Uh, or because then, then people have an idea, um, okay, we're referring to this, this uh, product, um, which will, again, be fully vetted uh, in terms of making sure that we have something that's cumulative, because I think that's a concern that was raised initially that it wasn't the intent to drop the areas outside of town. It was simply focusing in on the areas within which we have jurisdiction, but that's not fair to the fact that there's a 1974 map that shows the entirety of the area. And, and I believe uh, staff has gotten that direction previously is you know, make sure you show that on the map. So we will do that for the next meeting. Um, and uh, uh, we'll work on the, the ordinance language change and per, Commissioner Fragoso's comment, you know, maybe we could uh, come to a consensus at the next meeting that, hey, if it's still not something your commission feels comfortable about, um, let's go to the council because ultimately they're the ones who are going to adopt it or not. And they deserve an opportunity to, to give it a, you know, to give it their review. And it certainly has been at the planning commission for some time. So th that would be my recommendation at this point is, is, I've, I've got some direction. Um, let me and uh, Ms. Templeton uh, work on this and come back to your commission in January um, and hopefully wrap it up then. That sounds like a great suggestion, actually. Um, so are we, are we complete on this topic for tonight or moving on to the next? Uh, can I just ask a quick question just in terms of what is available uh, electronically um, for Fairfax, uh, you know, or the process. Bill, um, I'm thinking, um, Ben, if we were to start using this as a tool or, or directing people to look at this tool uh, that you've created, where would they find it electronically? It's an interesting question. I, the, the, the immediate answer is uh, Marin Map um, with a link uh, on our Fairfax planning page or in our regulations or some reference to say, hey, if you want to get to Marin Map through here, just click on this. So that would be one way to do it. But yeah, in Marin Map, um, we're in the process of working with them to get our some of our electronic products sorted out. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm thinking that this might be, there might be an easier solution uh, than we think. And 
Phil just said something about, um, you know, this standing up in court, if, if uh, you know, somebody got some bad advice or, you know, guidance and a judge said, well, you know, why weren't you looking at visual resource map number nine? Um, you know, the answer, you know, could be, or, or the problem could be solved with this amendment that says, or look at Marin Maps or go to this website, which is kind of what the county does already. Um, yeah. Whenever they do, you know, review projects or, you know, they, they're trying to help you, they always provide you with links uh, to where the most current information is. Mm -hmm. So not to say that these visual resources are not valuable, um, but there is always something that is, you know, it's just technology is changing so quickly all the time that these um, visual resources become historical. But, um, you know, if, if you want to get the latest uh, in terms of, what, uh, you know, what the counties or other jurisdictions are requiring, we go to the electronic files. So, uh, you know, I think this could be a two-part exercise um, and just kind of standing back and just trying to think about what what it is that we are trying to, you know, um, you know what our goal is, and thinking about you know why, um, you know why we're here. You know we're trying to help. You know it, it's kind of just I see it from both sides, and I see it from the beginning, and then when the project gets before us, it's almost too late. You know, in a sense, a lot of work has already been done. And so if we're trying to facilitate the people that we see, you know, before, yes. I think that would serve the public better. Uh, so let's, you know, maybe break this up because I think, I think everybody has a valid, you know, argument or approach to this. I think it's just a tall order to try to change 11 sections before we get to the, you know, Get to the point where we can send it up to the to the town council. So, I don't know maybe there is a, a very simple answer to this, so we can start using this great tool. Right, like Einstein, you came up with a simple answer. That's good. I like that. Okay, I think that's a great approach. I, I, I you know, so so think about that. There's some more direction. Whoops. Oh, there's some more direction. Um, I'm just thinking. You know, I don't know about you guys. I started at seven o'clock this morning, and I had to go for an MRI, and I'm, I'm exhausted, um, to be honest. So I'm just thinking through um, whether we're done with this topic, and whether we need to, whether we can jump to some other, like the election of the chair and vice chair, which has to be done this month. Um, but I'm concerned about folks out there attendees who are here for um, number five, the housing element update program discussion. Well, I can keep my uh, staff report very brief. It's really about pending work um, and just bringing it to your commission's attention. And, you know, frankly, I, I dare say people who've read uh, the staff report um, online or however they received it, you know, they're, they're getting the gist of what uh, is being proposed tonight. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on it if it's, if it's your commission's preference. Okay, I'm just seeing yawning and heads nodding and things like uh, that. Could, could I recommend that uh, through the chair, could I recommend yes. that we go ahead and hear a very brief report from Ben on the housing element with a limit of you know 10 15 minutes mm -hmm. because i have mm -hmm. i have another my next 3 hour meeting is in 7 hours mm -hmm. i need to have a bite to eat sleep have a life and be at a meeting again in 7 hours so i'd like to uh keep it going and and make it brief if we could there's no way we'll be able to really tackle the scope that's involved here tonight. No, but we Can do- Can I ask a question, question then? Is it feasible then to continue 
the housing element work outline to the next meeting? I'd be happy to do that as well. If I could I mean, is there a, a time yeah. issue or anything, or could we address this at the next meeting? Tonight I don't know, I'm just asking. Yeah, tonight's merely an overview. Um, I. I, I indicated the, the next steps in the work process and those uh, would, would be continuing. So I'm happy to uh, move that to the January meeting for a, a discussion and probably have a little bit more in-depth information to report. Now, the challenge is if your commission continues it, there may be one or two people from the public who stuck around till after midnight who'd like to speak. Um, That's what I was going to ask now, if we can if we Let's can see if out. there is anyone. Yeah. So, um, is is any is any of are any of the attendees here for housing element update work program discussion, which is basically a report? Ra raise hands, perhaps, or Tamala, maybe you can. Yes, I'll just say it again uh, in case a different voice might help people who may have fallen off a little bit. This is your time to talk, if you would like. Please raise your hand so we know you would like to if you are on a Zoom PC or Apple interface, you will be able to see the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. I do see we have one call in user who has already successfully used the raised hand command. So giving all that expertise out to the crowd, I do not see any hands raised and I think you can move on. Okay, thank you, boy. That's you've been great all year, by the way. This this has been a, a heck of a year, and you've you've been there for us. Thank you. Um, so, do, do we need a motion then to um, continue the housing element update work program discussion? I move we continue the discussion of the housing element until uh, our next meeting. And back what? When it comes back, can you include the timeline and the schedule where the consultant will be done, the county initiative will be done, and the fire deliverables that we talked about will be done? Uh, sure. Thank yes. you. Okay, is there a second? I second. Okay, okay I'll call the roll. Clark? Oh, she's not here. <laughs> Fregoso? Yes. Gonzalez Parber? Aye. Newton? Yes. Swift? Aye. Rodriguez? Aye. Chair Green? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, so housing element update work pro, uh, will be discussed next time. So we'll move on to the wonderful part of election of chair and vice chair. So um, I have been, I just want to say one thing. I've, I've been very happy to serve as chair this year. Um, it's been really a huge challenge getting used to Zoom and having their, you know, the meetings like this. Um, I'm kind of liking it. Um, and also uh, to staff for, you know, putting it all together. Um, again, special, special kudos to, to Tamala Fish for putting up with us and doing this uh, till all, all hours of the night sometimes. Um, and it's been wonderful being chair, and I loved it. And thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so thank much. You, I hope I, I hope I'm not too much of a bear doing it. So we need to move on, though, to to elections. So are there nominations? I would like to nominate Commissioner Rodriguez for chair, since she has been vice chair this year. I would second. Okay, uh, shall we take a vote on that? Maybe okay. you should ask Commissioner Rodriguez we first do because she's so cagey Excuse all the time. You know? Okay, so let's ask uh, Commissioner Rodriguez if she would be interested in that. I'm happy to accept the nomination. Thank you very much. Okay. Shall well, I? and it's, if, if I must say, it's not just because you've the, been the vice chair, but given your background in planning and your expertise, I think this will be a very critical year to have someone uh, who understands these issues uh, perhaps better than any of us. That staff, I don't know how to run a meeting with beans. 
Oh yeah, you can do oh, it. You can do. Yeah, I, had, I had to be kind. You did a great job, and also you know how to say no. So that's you know that's another. Thing. <laughs> um, so do we do we need a vote or is this sort of we need a vote? Need a vote. The call roll when it's a meeting. So okay, Fragoso. Yes. Gonzalez Parver. Aye. Newton. Aye. Swift. Aye. Chair Green. Aye. I don't know. Do you vote for yourself, Rodriguez? <laughs> Aye. Okay. okay. Hey, thank and you, uh, Chair you. Green, and thank you, Chair Elect Rodriguez. Now we need a vice chair, though, for next year. So, um, any any nominations for vice chair? I've heard. I'd of like them. to. I'd like to nominate. Uh, Commissioner Newton is vice chair. I'll second that. That was quick. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if there are any other nominations, uh, but I have heard rumors or emails going around about uh, Commissioner Fergoso. Actually, she went quiet. We need, we need to ask. Commissioner Newton, if she's willing to do it, I think she would be a oh, terrific vice chair. Agree. So, Commissioner Newton, are you willing to accept that position? Well, I, I do feel that I'm stepping out of line in some ways. Uh, I don't know if Esther had an interest in uh, being a vice chair, and I don't know if Norma. it's my turn next. Um, so let me let me pipe in. I had originally, I, I was asked, you know, did I have a recommendation? And I had recommended Esther as vice chair. Well, well, thank you. And I am honored. Um, unfortunately, um, I had a conversation with Ben uh, due to the pandemic and uh, family matters. Uh, I, I would be able to serve our community as I would wish. So I respectfully decline and nominate Mimi. <laughs> okay, that well, was a nice way to say that. Thank you. Yeah. I, am so sorry I, would that I would second Mimi's nomination if she is willing. Well, I think you guys are thirding and fourthing, so I'm all down with it. Okay, you know how to say no too, so that's that's probably a good thing. All right. Um, so we we as it was a second for Mimi uh, nomination. For so seconded it. Okay. I was the second for Mimi. We'll take a roll call vote. Okay. For Goso. Yes. Gonzalez Parber. Aye. Newton. Aye. Swift. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. Chair Green. Aye. Motion passes. A wonderful year. Thank you, guys. No, thank, thank you. you for taking it on, Mimi. Yes, thank you for that's brave. So, so can we discuss the work plan at the January meeting? I think you, I think you take over as chair. <laughs> You'll be the chair. No, you are the chair now. So, thank you, guys. Um, we got to go over the minutes and whatever you want to do. Take thank you, it. Phil. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for your efforts this year. I appreciate it. It's it's not an easy job. It is not, um, but it's it's been uh, fun, really fun. So, is somebody going to do the minutes? <laughs> so, I, I believe, um, I, th I think tradition or or required uh, that the, the new chair now take over, right? No, not until January. Not until January. All right then. So, any comments on the minutes? I recommend approval of the minutes of November 19th. Thank you. I'll second that motion. That's perfect. Let's have a roll call Great. vote. Then. Roll Fragoso. Um, uh, yes. Gonzalez Parber. 
Uh, Epstein, I was not there. Oh, okay. Newton? Aye. Swift? Aye. Rodriguez? Aye. Chair Green? Aye. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move on to the planning director's report. Um, you have a short report? <laughs> Very short. Uh, the main thing uh, to report is that the uh, Objective Design and Development Standards slash Historic Subcommittee um, met on November 3rd uh, with the design team uh, of Opticos and Plan to Place and our historic consultant, Ed Yarborough, um, went over kind of an outline of the toolkit slash draft ordinance for consideration and report back to the commission, which I hope to do very soon. Um, and one of the takeaways was that the historic context of any of this work is very crucial. And that's all I think I need to report tonight. Thank you. Commissioner Swift. I just had a quick question since you brought up um, the odds project. You had mentioned that we were going to have a web page on, yes, on the towns. Do you have an estimated time that would go up? Within two weeks. Thank you. Then were there any items of appeal from the planning commission to the council that had an outcome we should know about? Um, six Walsh, uh, but that was, was that prior to or after your last meeting? In any event, six Walsh was heard, heard by the council. I think I reported that at the November meeting. And what was the resolution? Uh, the, out, the application is okay. filed because of a 2-2 tie uh, resulting it in it being deemed, oh, excuse me, the appeal failed, I'm sorry, um, because of a 2-2 tie. And that's where it stands right now. Wouldn't that be opposite? A 2-2 tie on an appeal would be? We should probably uh, discuss this uh, at some future time. Let's discuss it next month. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you for your report. Any other? Comments on the report or questions? Okay. Uh, commissioner comments and requests. Any of those? Yeah. I, I, I request we um, adjourn soon so that we can get some sleep. Well, I just wanted to follow up on the public comment we got earlier during the non agenda, non agendized items about the. Uh, sounds of the chainsaws um, in the hills. And, you know, I think the, the idea that uh, the tree committee or, or the planning department or building department could police the sounds of chainsaws in the town is unrealistic. But I do think that we do have in the tree committee a fairly good record of trees that are slated to be cut down and so for people who uh, are noticing trees that are not referenced in the tree committee's minutes as being approved for removal um, you know they could make tips I think Ben right to to uh, the building and safety uh, department correct correct That's all I wanted to say. Okay, good, good point. Um, do I hear a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. Thank you. A second. I second. Okay. I second. <sighs> and it's our last meeting of the year. And I just want to uh, thank your commission for another year, and next year is going to be very exciting. Yeah, well, so Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. Happy New Year to everybody. Stay and healthy. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, staff, you'll be uh, gone from here to the end of the year, or we won't be hearing from you. Uh, you won't be at Town Hall. You'll be closed pretty much. Uh, We're pretty much. I think closed. that's fine, but. Somebody, somebody will be keeping you an eye on emails and things like that. 
We still need to vote on our motion to adjourn. Aye. Oh, did we get a, we did get a second. <laughs> I second. Yes, you did. Thank you. I think your stuff's uh, gone, Ben. Can we just Commissioner say anyone Gonzalez opposed? Parber? I'll do roll call. Commissioner Gonzalez Parber? Aye. Commissioner Rodriguez? Aye. Commissioner Green? Aye. Commissioner Swift? Aye. Commissioner Fragoso? Aye, aye, aye. Commissioner aye. Newton? Aye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good Thank night, you again. Everyone. Great year. Great year. Happy, happy holidays.